Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. We are here with perhaps the most interesting man alive today. I mean it. This guy is like a, not only a great guitarist, he's a really interesting dude. He's got loads of stories, genuine guy. He's a lot of fun, and he definitely has the best name ever of anyone who's been on this show. We're here at the one and only Smokey Hormel. Smokey's recording and touring career includes work with Johnny Cash, Adele, Beck, Tom Waits, Neil Diamond, Nora Jones, Joe Strummer, The Blasters, Steve Earle, Marianne Faithful, Justin Timberlake, Mick Jagger, Sean Lennon, and many others. That's a lot of firepower there, man. Uh, Smokey leads his popular Western swing band, Smokey's Roundup, at a packed weekly show at Sonny's Bar in Red Hook, Brooklyn. He's also got a dynamic Afro-Cuban group called Smokey's Secret Family, and they play New York shows regularly. He's got a couple of new albums coming out, one he produced and one that's his. And uh, just want to tell you, if you don't know Smokey, start by looking up the following videos on YouTube. Number one, Liner Note Legends number six with Smokey Hormel. Number two, Tom Waits, Chocolate Jesus. And number three, really great, Beck, The New Pollution. Did you guys, it looked like a lot of fun when you were making that, was it? Uh, it was so much fun. <laughs> I think uh, it was mostly done in one day, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And so, you know, it's got different sections. And uh, at the end, there's a heavy metal, like a... a yeah. Motley Crue section. And for that one, you know, it was the end of the day, the end of the shoot. And we we're honestly, we were really hammered. We, we <laughs> were living Motley Crue, you know, we we're drinking, we got totally wasted. So everything you're that seeing. So is like, Wait a minute. That was you guys dressed in the Motley Crue gear. Yeah. That was oh, me. Sh- knee slides and all that yeah. shit. <laughs> wow. You know what? I was, I had no idea because it, they, it was so unlike looking like you guys. And I was like, God, they put these guys in there like really on top of the, 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 the beat and everything. I was like, that's really weird. That's why now I know. Holy crap. That's you guys. That's we, even, we rented a gong just for the drummer, for Joe <laughs> to have a gong. And it, we, it, he even, there's so many little things in that video. It's, it's so great. I think, Beck actually directed it or co-directed it. That was uh, that was one of the highlights of that whole Beck thing. There's the point. There's a point where we jumped through an American flag. Like it was like every rock star fantasy we got to live out in that video. It was so much fun. That was cool, man. It looked like you guys was having a, were having a blast. Let me say that again. That's Beck, the new pollution. Check that out. And you can see Smokey. Hey, man, you got a ton of stories. I'm gonna like randomly start asking sure. questions that if you want to redirect, you tell me, man. Uh, how did you meet Peter Fonda? <laughs> okay. I, I grew up in LA. Um, and back then in the sixties, LA was a lot smaller and Malibu was like a little, kind of like a little village really. It was an enclave of, there were the rich people, but then there was like, you know, just people who lived at the beach. And, uh, so, we would spend the summers out there and the, the kids, you know, I, I was friendly with the other kids and we would all we were like a gang of little kids running around. And so we'd go over to, you know, Preston's house or over to Steve's house or whatever. So whatever, you know, the parents were having parties. Well, one of those kids was, um, uh, in the Hagman family, Larry Hagman, mm. uh, Larry had this big house and he always had parties. So, we just always end up over there because it was just a fun place to be. And the parents were really cool, these hippies. And I liked it because there was some musical instruments. There was a guitar laying around. I could go play the guitar unmolested. <laughs> um, so one day I'm sitting there and I'm trying to, I was trying to learn. Um, I was really into Feliciano's Light My Fire. Oh, great. Yeah. Like I tried to learn that. It, I was like nine or 10, you know, something like that. <laughs> And, uh, and this hippie dude comes over and he's like, Hey kid, you want to learn to play the, you want to learn the blues? And I was like, sure. You know, so he shows me this, uh, blues thing. That's really cool. It was actually the pusher man by, uh, Steppenwolf, Steppenwolf, which is a really great little E position blues pattern that I've used repeatedly. And in fact, 
there's a Beck song where it's totally, you can hear it in there. I think it's from Sea Change. There, uh, uh, what's the name of the song? Put your hands on the weed. Oh, the Golden Age. So you can hear it in there. Um, not that, you know, Peter uh, Steppenwolf didn't invent that, but uh, it's just a standard thing. Anyway, but, you know, the, that guy was Peter Fonda. And, wow. Uh, you know, he was... He was just one of the cool, groovy hippies that was hanging out that I idolized as a little kid. We used to follow them around. They would have these big parades where Larry had all these flags. And so the hippies would get their flags out. And at sunset, they would walk up and down the beach. And there'd be a whole gang of kids just following along. And uh, here's a good story. So one, one time, we're doing this hippie, whatever, flag parade down the beach. And there's this figure walking towards us and he's like goose stepping as we get cl closer. It's Keith moon in full Nazi regalia. Get out of here. In the, <laughs> the Holy crap. <laughs> Just to fuck with us. <laughs> to fuck oh with my me. God. That is so <laughs> wild. Yeah. It was when he was living down there in, in Malibu. I think he would terrorize the whole neighborhood. Um, I think what happened was uh, before he finally left, the story I heard was he showed up at Steve McQueen's house and he was so drunk. And Steve's son, uh, Chad, who was had been studying um, martial arts, it, I guess Keith must have lunged at him and Chad just popped him right in the face and knocked him out. Wow. Uh, and that was <laughs> every, every story I've ever heard about Keith Moon always starts with Keith was really hammered. <laughs> I mean, like every story I've ever heard about him, man. Unfortunately, you know what a brilliant drummer, but yeah, man, yeah, yeah. that's one. <laughs> it's funny when you said Larry Hagman. Of course, like the first thing that comes to my mind is like, oh, was Barbara Eden traipsing around his house? <laughs> well, it's great that you mentioned that because in their backyard, this is a period when Larry hadn't been working. You know. Uh, I Dream of Jeannie was long gone and, um, you know, Dallas hadn't come yet, but he was, I remember cause my parents were friends of his and, and so he was doing theater at the time, you know, he was just an actor trying to work. So he was doing plays. We actually went to see him in a play, but the, referring back to the, I Dream of Jeannie thing, he had, uh, a prop from the show, the, the bottle, the genie bottle. Oh the, man that she would crawl out of. Yeah. Yeah. The one they used to, yeah. And that was sort of, you know, the kids sort of play area. We would like take over and play in there. It was like really cool. That's what <laughs> he bottle. So growing up when you were, did you realize that other, that this was a very different way of growing up than can most people were not living that lifestyle? No, it kind of hit me pretty hard once I started, uh, it really, once I turned 16 and, and got a, uh, access to a car and got out of my little bubble world that I lived in, um, you know, music, I was interested in music. And so um, I got in a band with this kid who was a little older, this guitar player, and um, we were the only white guys. It was, a, it was like a gospel funk band with these other young kids. And... Um, so I'd be driving down to, you know, like, I don't know if you know L.A. at all, but I was totally on the west side, the rich sort of, uh, the rich side of town where the coast is. And so I want, the first time I actually drove past downtown into east L.A. or southeast L.A., it was like a shock. It, it really. Um, oh, you literally went to the other side of the tracks. Uh, yeah exactly i crossed the tracks and it was like whoa okay you know um it's it was good because i was searching for the blues you know and i found it yeah. um in more than i bargained for but um but yeah it, i i grew up in a very rarefied uh world and um you know it wasn't all great uh but it definitely i ha i was protected from a lot of harsh reality that I later had to face. Um, in terms of my upbringing, in terms of music, I was lucky because um, 
I had older siblings and they had, you know, the normal taste of the time. So, you know, I heard the Beatles when they first came out and I heard, uh, you know, they were really into the California rock bands like the birds and Buffalo Springfield, the doors. So I grew up on that stuff and, um, it's a big part of my musical personality. And it's funny cause you, you were, you know, thinking about who the guitar players who influenced me, um, I realized that because my formative years were so much involved with AM radio, it would have to be the wrecking crew. It would have to be like Glenn Campbell, Tommy Tedesco, Howard Roberts. Like I didn't know that's who I was hearing, but that's who I was hearing. Like sure. Bill Pullman, all those guys that later I learned about and I actually got to be friends with Larry Nechdol. And so he schooled me about, you know, Mike DC, all those, all the guys who actually play guitar on those records. Um, so I'm really lucky. I'm I'm lucky to be the age I am, and that I had older siblings who were fairly sophisticated when it came to music. Gee, I would imagine growing up, it sounds like those creativity seeds were like really planted young and really well fertilized for you. Well, I'm I'm. I also had the for good fortune of uh, my mom was a dancer, so she, uh, she's grew up uh in france and and she was a ballerina and when she came to america and married my dad she brought that love of music and of dance with her and um so there were in, in my very early years there were a lot of like great parties at our house and and she had friends who uh were musicians who knew musicians so there were always some sort of band playing or musicians hanging out. So I was really fortunate to oh, really cool. grow up in, in LA at that time when people still actually got together and jammed. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's really funny. I had a, I interviewed a guy, a jazz player originally from France, as a matter of fact, and he was living in the city. Um, maybe you might know him. His name is, uh, Laurent Medelji. He's not there anymore, but he was there for a while. Anyway, he said, you know, I said, what was the toughest thing about coming to the States? He goes, you know, Craig, it was really weird. In Fran in Paris, people like go to each other's houses and they have dinner. <laughs> he goes, so I would invite all these people to my house and like some of them would show, some of them would never, sh would not show. He goes, but nobody ever invited me anywhere. And I'm like, man, that's just people don't really do that anymore. It's really kind of, you know, yeah. you, you might have a backyard barbecue on a Sunday or something like that. But the dinner thing is like, unfortunately, because I remember that as a kid too, it's kind of a thing of the past, I think. I don't know why. Yeah, it, it's sad. Yeah. It's not the same. Well, hey, uh, I heard a story, man, and this is classic. You once called up Barney Kessel to, to ask him to teach you guitar lessons, man. Besides yeah. having massive balls and you know, courage to do that. Tell me about this thing. Well, that's kind of a reflection of, um, the parenting I had because, uh, you know, uh, how do I put it? Well, at one point I, I discovered jazz or what I thought was jazz and, and how that happened was, um, I got into Mahu Vishnu orchestra. Oh yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to take my hat off. Go ahead, man. Uh, uh, and so I told I, – I really, to me, jazz just meant playing a lot of notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, I hate to say it, but it seems like that's what it means to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're talking up like 12, 13. And, and the way I discovered Mahavishnu was my brother had – we went to go see Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and uh, the orchestra opened for them. Oh, wow. It was like, you know, a 13-year-old kid seeing that. It changed my life. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, God, you know. Uh, so I told my came back and told my dad, um, yeah, I want to learn jazz. And he said, okay, well, I guess the best jazz guitarist is Barney Kessel. Here's what you should do. Call the union and ask for his number and then call him. So my dad knew enough that at that in those days you could just call the union directory and get anybody's number. So I did. I was like 
you know, and it, so that he. What'd you say? You called him up and said, "Hey, I want to book Barney." <laughs> no, I, I got him on the phone. He answered his own phone, and which is unusual because back then those guys worked so much they had an answering service. But he he answered the phone, thinking it, you know, probably thinking it was a gig. And here's this little kid. How old were you at the time? Thirteen. I'm this like, is awesome, man. I want to take guitar. <laughs> I want to learn to play jazz. And he's like laugh. He's laugh. You could tell he was trying not to laugh, but he was really laughing. You know, and I felt so embarrassed. But the be- it was the best thing ever because he said, well, I can't teach you, but I'm going to refer you to someone who who really is a great teacher. And he didn't turn out to be just a great teacher. He turned out to be one of my mentors and a guy that I look still to this day. I look up to his career and what he did with guitar as like one of the true pioneers. And that's Jimmy Weibel. Um, if you don't know about don't Jimmy. Don't know him, man. You got to check him out. He uh, he started off. He's from Port Arthur, Texas. Oh shit, the, Johnny Winter. Oh, a lot of people, Janis Joplin. Yeah, and, but he's a lot older than them. He he started off uh, playing with Bob. Well, before that, he was in a bunch of Western swing bands, mm. and he joined Bob Will's band in like '40, I think, when Bob moved to California. Um, and Jimmy came with his friend Cameron Hall they were uh, they were the first twin guitars and they originated the whole thing of unison what they would do is they would play like Charlie Christian riffs in unison but or in harmony and um, they were super uh, pioneers of this whole you know they 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 took what Charlie Christian was doing and they expanded on it in their own way and if you listen to a song like roly poly by bob wills you hear jimmy's brilliant soloing uh definitely a charlie christian devotee but then later in the 50s he got even more serious about jazz he studied classical guitar with uh lorindo almeida he um he joined benny goodman's band uh well First, he joined Red Norvo, and he's in the original Ocean's Eleven, uh, backing up Dean Martin. You can see him in in there. Um, but he was in uh, Red Norvo's group, this killer uh, sort of post-bop uh, swing. I don't even know what to call it, like West Coast swing. They're just one of the great. Uh, units at the time and then Benny Goodman came and scooped them up in the late 50s and they toured with him they also backed up Frank Sinatra on a, on a couple Holy. so wow what and, a career and then after that he ended up you know uh, being part you know with Barney and with Howard Roberts he was one of the and Herb Ellis he was one of the guys in LA doing all the TV and film stuff until his wife got ill and he retired from that and was a teacher. So that's when I met him. Um, and it's what, how do you spell W E I Oh, W Y B L E W Y B L E. Great. I'm going to check him out. Thanks. And he's still, he's still around. No, he passed away about 10 years ago. And, um, I was fortunate enough to reunite with him in, uh, like 2000. And then we, we became pretty close again. And, I was a terrible student when I was a teenager because I wasn't really hip to anything. I just wanted to play fast and loud. But he he schooled me, and it, it, it was right at the time when he made this beautiful record called Jazz Etudes. Um, you can still find it on eBay, um, and other people have done their versions. But he composed these. It's basically like if... Debussy and Ravel had a baby with, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really complex, harmonic, beautiful jazz, but with these melodious, just these beautiful melodies. And his, he had such a soul, uh, such a soulful connection to the instrument. Like, you know, you'd hand him a guitar, he'd never seen before played before and he just sort of hold it and you could see him sort of feeling what does the guitar want me to play and he'd start playing and he'd be like oh you know like 
every guitar it, i kind of learned that from him it's like every guitar has its own music you know you, it has something to offer you if you're if you're open enough to it and that was sort of his approach to life like you know he would make me feel like i was teaching him yes <laughs> he's one of those great people I'm, i actually have his photo right here on my desk i'm looking at <laughs> that's awesome it's interesting yeah. you say that you weren't a good student because and and that that's the kind of player he was because i'm not gonna lie to you and tell you I, i've listened to tons of your stuff but i did a lot of research to for the interview and everything i watched you are very deliberate and you're very you're a gentle player if that makes sense you know you're very um it's like just very harmonious between you and the instrument. That was my vibe. So it's interesting that you're saying basically the same thing about about your teacher because that's how you come off, man. Very gentle, very like deliberate, um, but like zero stress at all. And that's really attractive when I'm listening to a musician. It's like, you know, it's a very organic – you know, natural stuff, whether you're doing your Western swing, whether you're doing with stuff with Beck, it was like very chilled out, man. And that, I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jimmy was, you know, he was kind of the master of that. And he, uh, you know, he told me that when he first started working with Benny Goodman, he was, I mean, that was like the scariest gig ever, you know, because <laughs> has these microscopic ears. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't, if you, played the same riffs in this in during your solo you know with two nights in a row or something you know benny he didn't want that he wanted people to just really be you know he wanted you at your best and you're he didn't want anyone phoning anything in. yeah <laughs> he'd show up early and he'd be studying the charts you know right away and he really worked hard and that was his ethic. It's like you do the work before and then when you're playing, you're in the moment. You're not, you know, the work is behind you. When you're playing, you're just listening and, you know, being in the moment. But his whole, the, the thing with, the theme with Benny Goodman is you're not going to just get up there and show what you got because that's not playing music. That's just showing off. If you're really a musician, you're going to be listening and responding in the moment and creating something new and so i remember he was that was one of the things that he really taught me not so much back then later yeah yeah but how 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 uh what a gift that is to have received that message from somebody because i think that that's probably non-existent for the most part now because nobody just has the time you know in the music business being what it is it's like you know everybody's worried about their next gig already <laughs> when they're on stage not everybody but a lot of times and it's a necessity it's not like a a, a, a flaw it's like a necessity for now you know yeah. but what a gift to have received that that's really cool yeah he, it was it was great he was, i'm really blessed i think some of his other students i know he was close to steve lukather and i think uh anthony wilson was also a student of his uh trying to remember uh well dave dave koontz dave and larry oh, koontz. Wow. uh he was he's really well known in the in jazz circles mostly um and it's jimmy weibel w-y-b-l-e i'm gonna check him out so any of the listeners want to check him out check him out you won't be disappointed no <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely gonna look at him um talk about some more stories man if you're good with that uh sure. just for a little bit Talk about some of these guys that I'll throw out some names. If you can maybe uh, describe the nature, how you got the gig and the nature of the engagement. And if there's any cool story or interesting story working with sure. them. First, let's start with Beck. And also I was curious what it was like playing in like 70,000 seat stadiums. That had to be intense. Well, it's, it's funny cause um, the Beck thing, uh, it came not it wasn't the beginning of my career or anything so i i came to it with some um a lot of weird different experiences behind me already um in other words you know having been having been in the blasters helped prepare me for beck in an interesting way and having actually been a uh, i was a dancer in my teens and 20s 
that actually prepared helped me a lot. I also studied theater, so I I think the Beck thing it wasn't just playing guitar. It drew on a whole lot of uh, life experiences that I ha- had on stage. Um, so when you talk about playing in front of seventy thousand people, suddenly you know it's not about playing guitar so much anymore as you know projecting you know there's a stage presence you got to remember that it there's cameras on you that are going to be on the jumbotron there's all this stuff and then you've got beck who's you at that in those days you never knew what he was going to do like uh it it could it could flip on a dime like between uh total be- total peaceful beauty and mayhem you know so so you had to be at and you know i was lucky because when i was a uh, doing dance and theater i did some weird performance art stuff you know and i i i was kind of comfortable with chaos on stage so <laughs> it wasn't um it wasn't something i was afraid of it was something i actually enjoyed and so getting to play with beck it was like i could draw on all these different parts of my personality and and the key was making sure that I was doing my job and giving him what he needed. You know, there were, there, it was trial and error. There were times when, you know, I was way over the top and he'd come over with his back to the audience and say, dude, chill out or you know, something <laughs> settle down. Smokey. <laughs> It's exciting when you're on stage in front of all those people. It's fucking nuts. And, and, you know, yeah, the I mean, energy flow must, the energy exchange has got to be off the charts, man. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, it's, you can't just, there's words can't do it justice. I mean, it's like, you know, I, when I was younger, besides dance, I was really into skiing and skateboarding and surfing. And it's that kind of adrenaline rush that you get when you're like barreling down a mountain, knowing that like any mistake you can just would be, <laughs> uh, and that's sort of the feeling when you're up there and with all those people, it's like, okay, this is it. You know, there's no going back, whatever happens. So, uh, so yeah, it was truly like uh, a dream come true. And, and it was, uh, I was glad, you know, I'm 10 years older than Beck and, and the other guys in the band. So, um, but I'm not saying I'm more mature than them. <laughs> so, you know, Let's like, get this clear. <laughs> yeah. It's good that I found people on my level <laughs> of maturity. So even though I was 10 years older, I felt like I could relate. Sure. In, sure. I'm, you know, to what, what we were doing. And, um, and you know, there's so many in terms of guitar, um, when I started, well, I met Beck originally cause, uh, Joey Warnaker, his longtime drummer, he and I were friends and had played together and Joey got the gig. And then after a couple of years, Beck was looking for a guitar player and I had auditioned, um, for one tour and he couldn't, he, he was undecided. So I took another gig and then the following year he decided to, try me out and it worked out but uh his the thing i learned already before i started working with beck is that my job was not to change his sound or to um to add anything that that he didn't already have my job was to actually understand what his concept of guitar was and and just make it stronger, like add to it. But it, it all had to then where he was coming from the player. So, so it, like, for example, if you're an actor and you want to portray uh, a character, you got to do research and find out, okay, where did this character come from? What did they, what did they want? What did they believe in all that? So it's the same thing with Beck. It's like, okay, where did he, who were his guitar influences? So, Fortunately, we had a lot of the same influences, so that saved a lot of extra work. But there were a lot of things I had no idea about. You know, the whole Sonic Youth um, approach to guitar, I was kind of clueless about. And it, 
And even though other people like John Doe had tried to hit me to them, I didn't really get it until I started working with Beck. And and then we would see all these bands too because we'd be on the same bill. So that was uh, it was an amazing education. And I have to say that Beck is a huge influence on my playing today. Um, I don't play the same as I did before I started playing with him. In, in uh, what way? Um there's a lot of ways uh, talk about specifically like slide guitar his approach to the slide guitar is so great it's so minimal and in a real blues way he's not he's never going to overplay it's going to be underplayed it's going to be uh it you know it's not about getting all the notes it's about the intention and maybe not making it is more exciting you know and so just like the the things I played on his record, I wouldn't have played if it was somebody else. So I was, I'm really just trying to kind of be psychic and like, what would he want to play? What would he want to hear? You know, he's singing and strumming the acoustic guitar because he's trying to get a good take. But part of him also wants to do the solo, but he can't do everything. So that's my job is do it how he would do it. So, so yeah, there's, he he's he's kind of got an aversion to slickness unless it's over the top like funny like but you know like there's a whole generation of guitarists my age who you know just learn to shred right out of the gate and um that's kind of boring you know so I had to sort of and, and I never I don't consider myself a shredder so <laughs> that was good I I I feel like I could relate to where Beck's coming from. It's like, um, not that he can't shred. <laughs> no, no, you're not. Well, one of the things that I'm getting, which is really important, which I think the best um, guitar players are very aware of, is that you're in the service business, man. And you were providing, you know, your job wasn't to be, you know, like the badass Smokey Hormel that you can be. It was to provide the service that Beck, you know, your your artist, in this case, Beck, was looking for, you know, and right. I think that's a real, like, very re real thing. And I don't, I think people that are not aware of that are in a, uh, like, in a coma or something like that. You're in the, you know what I mean? That's, that's your freaking job, man. You know, and yeah. it sounds like you took it really seriously and you studied it and you, you know, you wanted to be, you know, like you said, you had to envision what he was looking for and deliver it on a nightly basis. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it was, and, and it, as you know, that those, those first couple of years when we were playing to the huge audience, huge crowds, um, it really felt it, it had everything that you dream about and being in a rock band, it had that feeling of camaraderie and of, um, you know, teamwork and uh, there's room for everybody. Um, and he was very generous in that way. You know, he, he, um, it, in fact, the more I think of it, given how his age and how quickly the success hit, it's amazing how well he handled it. Yeah. Know, I understand like, that. Um, and you know, there was a lot of, uh, it, I mean, there's, there's, there were a lot of crazy moments. There was one, <laughs> You know, you talk about embarrassing things. So here I am on tour with Beck. We're in Australia and um, playing for this sort of – the crowd's a little younger there. Um, and I had never really stage dove. And I'd always <laughs> wanted to. This is great, Smokey. I could love where this is going. <laughs> so so we in, – in, in on that tour, we would do the thing where we would play this really – insane last song and then leave the dj up there to do a solo we would go into the dressing room we had all these crazy sort of uh well leftover motley crew stuff from the video but also like weird bondage outfits and so <laughs> we're, we're doing this quick change to come out you know rock metal wigs and all this shit and the the weird pant thing that i was supposed to wear wasn't there and i was like shit what am i gonna do and so i thought oh i'll just make myself like because i was wearing basically like a g-string i'll 
I'll make this out of uh, black tape, you know, I'll just <laughs> tape. So I taped this. It, it ended up looking like a diaper, really, but it was <laughs> like black gaff tape, you know. And so, you know, I've got the boots and the wig and the weird sort of chest plate thing. And I'm, you know, trying to be all heavy metal and crazy. And so, OK, here's my chance to stage dive. So I go I go to stage dive and I realize as I'm running toward the edge, the kids aren't looking at me. Oh, my they're not, God. They're not going to see me. So it's too late to stop, but I kind of slowed down. So I kind of dove into the barricade. So I landed like on my hips on oh. the barricade and slowly flipped over, at which point the, the tape came off and it's just <laughs> naked ass hanging over the barricade. And I dropped onto the uh. floor looking down at me like, you know, and, I, and I'm <laughs> – Okay, now I'm in the crowd and I'm totally embarrassed. And how do I get back up on stage? Like now we're like, <laughs> with nothing on, with yeah, <laughs> like this tape gap, you know, diaper around my knees. You know, it's just holy crap! Just but you know, those are the kind of things that only you know, only with Beck would I find myself in that situation. That's you know? funny, man. Not bad for me. <laughs> I hope they had I hope they had alcohol backstage for you because you certainly needed a drink after that, man. No, my chiropractor loves that story. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I bet. That's a that's a lead generation for chiropractic services, man. Wow. Uh, uh talk about the blasters, man. And I was curious when you played with them, were you like a th- a third guitarist? Is that another rhythm, another lead? Like how did that work? Uh, here's what happened. Um the blasters it was the alvin brothers phil and dave yeah and um it was their band and then and they made all these great records but then at some point you know as brothers do there was some power struggle and dave being the guitar player who wrote most of the songs who got writing credit he you know he got fed up with fighting with his brother and he decided to leave the band for a while so he joined x uh, at the time, Billy Zoom was having trouble with X, so he quit. So Dave came in and became one of the guitar players in X. So then the Blasters got uh, this amazing guitar player, one of the great blues guitar players. If you don't know about him, you got to look him up, Hollywood Fats. Yeah, and I never heard. I got to look him up. I'm surprised Rick Holmstrom didn't mention him because he is one of the great west coast blues guys of all time and um he died unfortunately while he was in the blasters about a year into his uh tenure with the blasters he had a drug problem and that's too bad got the best of him so i was uh the next guy to replace dave after him there was actually billy zoom did one tour with the blasters which sounded like it must have been amazing because billy's a big hero of mine too but um i came in after hollywood fats basically and uh i did it for about four years so i was the lead guitar player and um with and with with dave not with dave with, dave because dave was gone so dave, phil was so it's fi- okay phil okay right so it's phil all right phil so plays the guitar and sings and so i was playing lead guitar and it was such a great thing for me uh the not only because I had, because the, well, number one, the songs were so good. So cool, man. Dave's songwriting is just impeccable. And, and then to have to learn all his guitar parts, which was so different from the way I played, but it really was great. It is that thing about an actor studying again. It was the same thing. It was like, you know, here's this guy. We're, we're not that far apart in age and we're both from LA, but we're both from completely different worlds. And I was lucky enough that through Jimmy Weibel, I knew how to play jump blues and swing. And I think that's what made the blasters want me. Cause I knew the old style sort of Charlie Christian, T-Bone Walker influence stuff. I knew nothing about surf music. I knew nothing really about the blues. I mean, I knew, blues through rock you know but i didn't really know the blues i didn't really know about rockabilly so i had to learn i had to study all that stuff to be in the band and it was the best it was like going to american you know getting a degree in american music from the best university you know and phil alvin is an amazing uh has its encyclopedic mind so 
you know, on tour, we would go to thrift stores and buy 70 blues, 78s and gospel music. And he just, it was, it was like a four year degree program. It it was incredible. That's awesome, Uh, man. And, and the best part was that the blasters had this great sax player, Lee Allen, right? Lee was the, um, one of the original rock and roll sax players, heroes. Uh, he played on, uh, Fats Domino, little Richard, um, Lloyd price. I mean, he's on so many killer rock, rock and roll records from the fifties out of new Orleans. He, he was from that whole, uh, new Orleans scene. And he, like a lot of those musicians in the sixties moved to California, uh, cause the work wasn't, flowing as much so um and it if through some random thing he and the blasters uh, and and the alvin brothers father uh they had mutual friends and so he was one of their big influences and when i joined the band the one of the first days he said to me uh smoky i'm gonna relax you (laughs) and that was it man that's what he did he I went to jam. He invited me to jam sessions in South Central, and um, and those jam sessions were. It was him and a lot of other guys his age, and they were all in. They were all just playing like you know, it was like uh, jazz standards, like you know, just you, just me, you know, songs like that. But you know, these were guys who were rock and roll pioneers, but they were still just jazz musicians, you know, at heart. And so they get together and, you know, I, I learned so much from those guys and from Lee and the, the thing besides his big heart and the fact that he was so generous and took a liking to me and, and took it upon himself to help me. Um, when I listen to his solos now, like, okay, uh, take little Richard's long, tall Sally. There's a sax solo in there. I mean, he'll start with a beautiful, just a, a, a phrase, and then he'll leave a big hole, and then he'll answer it. And then when it comes to the turnaround, he'll play something super simple and just, just, you know, just barely enough, but it's so, it's so restrained that it's perfect, you know. It, there, he never breaks a sweat, it seems. You know, he, he just, I remember him saying, because with the blasters, it's like a lot of fast tempos sure. and, you know, loud eighth note downstrokes. You know, it's, it's fucking strenuous. And he'd say, don't worry about all that noise. Just play something pretty. You know, and he's right. I didn't have to do anything. Those guys are all raging. If I just play some pretty line, it's way better than if I'm sitting there trying to, like, you know, keep up and play a lot. Of, it's no, it's. The contrast is what makes it so beautiful. So you listen to his solos on any of those little Richard or Fats Domino records, and it's just like, you know, it, it, it's it's that thing that makes rock and roll sexy because you got that raging testosterone and teenage energy, and then here's just some sweet, sexy whisper, you know, in your ear. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the ladies love Lee Allen. You know, he could... He could say anything and charm anybody. You know, the, I could say the same thing and be like, "Ew, you creep!" <laughs> he just had that. You know, he just understood. It's a New Orleans thing. It's, um, I think, all the best musicians have that. They know they come from a place of strength, so they don't have to show off. They're just yeah. There, it's less. A, it's not about dick measuring kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and or yeah, I totally get that, man. I think people in general are. You know, they. I think people who are sometimes confident in general give that vibe of, of, as long as it's not cocky, but confidence also breathes comfort. You know, like it sounded like you were really, like he was looking after you and it sounded like you were very comfortable in there, you know, like a big brother kind of looking after kind of thing, you know? And I think that I've seen that myself for sure, man. Yeah, he, he, um, I mean, he, was starting to get sick towards the end of my run with them. And actually when he stopped, 
uh, being well enough to go on the road, that's when I decided it was time for me to leave the band because, um, you know, I was, it was a dysfunction. It was a family, but it was a dysfunctional family. And I was starting. Wait to- a minute. Aren't they all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fill I, me I, in. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't change any of them. Sure. And, and I had such um, great memories and stuff. But yeah, I remember actually Ry Cooter told me, uh, he said a really funny thing because um, I was friends with him at the time. And he said, you're like a drowning man. No, no, you're like a man who's treading water with four guys who are drowning who don't know how to swim. Even <laughs> out of there, they're going to pull you down. <laughs> and, I mean, it was over-exaggerated, but it, it he definitely nailed it. Like, that was, okay, it's time for me to leave. And, yeah. um, and I, I mean, that's an important lesson, too. It's really important to know when to leave a situation. That, yeah. You know, when it stops, you know, if it stops being fun, if you're not learning anything and you're not making enough money to stay there, then it's, you know, and if you're not satisfied musically, artistically, then it's time to move. You know? Well, I also chaos is like, I don't know how you feel, but like, I'm, I hate it, man. I'm not, I'm, I don't like drama. I'm, you know, but I have to say at a, different time in my life, I wasn't aware of that and I would have gone along with it. Now it's like, fuck first sign of any drama nonsense with anybody in a business situation. I'm like done, man. I'm, that's just not my deal. You know, you want to be in relationships that at least if you don't feel energized after you interact, you don't feel like fucking spent, you know, you want to have some good exchange of energy and hopefully you both feel, or, you know, the group feels like, yeah, you know, we all feel like on 10, but like when you get that chaos shit, that's, you know, yeah. it's just bad, man. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's, I mean, I, I think back on it is like, wow, four years, that was a good, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I, I had that. Yeah. That's a good run. Yeah. And, and really I can't emphasize enough the educational value of being in that group. I mean, I could, there's no way I would have been able to do the Beck thing if I hadn't done that first. I mean, uh, just, you know, the learning about the roots of gospel and blues and all that stuff it was totally i was drawing on that when i worked with Beck. i totally and and actually the soloing too i was i would always you know if i was in doubt i was like well what would lee do in this situation you know what what would he play you know so there was so much that of that that really helped me but at the time i really felt more like an actor than a guitar player. And, and, you know, I, I had just been studying theater before that. So of course that's where I was coming from, but it really was like putting on a character, you know, I never wore my hair in a pompadour before that, you know, I had, <laughs> had, a, had a motorcycle jacket, you know, I remember one day. So you really I, had to get in character. Oh, totally. Cause they were serious about it. You know, it wasn't a character for them. No, that, I mean, <laughs> It might well. It was in a way, but that's the that was their. They own that character. Yeah. That was their only character. <laughs> I remember there were two funny things about that. One time I was we were about to go on stage, and I was stretching my legs in you know as a dancer would before a performance. Sure. You know, just stretching. And uh, one of the guys came up and said, "Man, don't do that. That's so uncool." <laughs> 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 and, then, and then the other thing was oh my god wait a minute. that's too funny I like towards the end um, <laughs> don't do so, that here <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. like maybe someone's gonna see you. that and that's not cool um oh my god and then <laughs> there was a, i had so towards the end of my run in the blasters i had already started this other band called the blue shadows with the drummer from the blasters and this guy Lester Butler, and we played every Monday night at this club in LA called the King King. Hmm. It was a new club that had just started, and it was a scene because um, it was a perfect time in Hollywood. A lot of actors were showing up, and this uh, is a some, somewhat professional skater, and he worked at Thrasher Magazine. So we had all these skaters showing up. So that meant there were a lot, a lot of models showing up. So oh, that yeah, meant that's always awesome. Actors. And, you know, it was just, it was a scene. Um, anyway, one night, Phil Alvin 
from the blasters came to sit in with us and um i had these green doc martens and he was just so not into it he was like <laughs> it started calling he's i think my nickname was clown shoes oh my god that. it was just so funny how like you know, in retrospect, they were Doc Martens. They're, the only thing uncool is that they were green. And actually, I I never thought they were uncool. I was bummed that I grew out of them. But <laughs> <laughs> that's just but like we, we don't we don't do that here. It was so offensive to Phil. It was so funny, you know, because oh they were black, and <laughs> they were green. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So, so you had some really good mentors between Lee and Jimmy. You had some real good mentoring relationships, man. <laughs> Phil, Phil too. I mean, he was, Phil was like a a mad professor, you know, he, he, he was very generous with his knowledge and, um, yeah, I mean, I've been really lucky in that I've had, you know, I've, I've had really great musicians who were nice people who took a liking to me and were able to share, Hmm. Yeah, that's that's really fortunate. I wonder if Lee ever played with. Do you happen to know uh, Kelvin Holly? No, I don't know that name. He's been uh, Richards, could you know, lead player for like twenty five years. I wonder if they played together. M- must have with Little Richard. Yeah, yeah. He's I out. Of, he's out of Muscle Shoals. Oh, I bet he does. Um, I don't know. You know, when Lee was sick, uh, we were trying to do a, a benefit for him at the House of Blues, and I remember I called up Little Richard. And he answered his phone and pretended he was not him. He pretended he was like <laughs> slur or something, but you knew it was him. You know? <laughs> um, oh and my our, god! He 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 apologized, but he couldn't do the benefit. Um, and then he said, "Well, you know, tell Mister Allen that Mister Richard sends his love." <laughs> <laughs> So I told Lee that, and I remember he's like, "Well, tell him next time he throws his rings in the river, he should. Next time he finds Jesus and throws his diamond rings in the river, he should think of me." <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, Kelvin told me those stories were like a, a, a different story a day with with Richard. Yeah. That he was pretty pretty much a, a trip. Yeah, I saw an interview with you smoking. You talked about you've worked with some major artists, and you mentioned about being a little intimidated with some of the artists you work with and how you dealt with this. And I thought it was a really, a really mature way of handling this situation. And I was wondering if you'd mind sharing with the listeners, because these are most of the listeners, 90% of them are all professional guitar players. Okay. Um, is there, was there someone in particular? Uh, maybe. Well, I mean, my next question was with Johnny Cash. So maybe it was with, with Mr. Cash, you know, you always called him, which I thought was, 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 the, I was curious if that was the only artist you ever so formal with. Well, I, that was something that the people around him were calling him Mr. Cash. So it just seemed like the yeah. way to refer to him. And then it just felt right. And, uh, and it, it, he, it's befitting his stature to refer to him that way. You know, I never, I never, I mean, I guess I might've called him Johnny to his face, but, uh, whenever we would talk about him, when he was was Mr. Cash. Yeah. It would be weird if everybody's like Mr. Cash and and you're like, yeah, me and Johnny did. (laughs) That would be kind of weird. But you know, (laughs) anyone deserves that. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, man. I mean, my experience with him was really uh, profound in so many ways. And, you know, I think everyone's is because he's just that kind of person. He's, he's sort of a, a holy man in, in a way. I mean, maybe his family wouldn't feel that way, but I sure did. Um, it was great because, all right. So the, that band I was in the blue shadows that was playing at the King King, um, they, they, I I left the band because they wanted to play a little more heavy sort of Stevie Stevie Ray Vaughan style, and I was going in a more sort of back porch blues direction, and we were just fighting a lot. So anyway, I quit. Um, but Rick Rubin really liked the combo, so he had us come in to do some songs with Mr. Cash, and um, so there we were in the studio. We were all set up and. At that point, um, you know, I wasn't in the, I wasn't really in the band. So, um, but I, I, I didn't feel, what am I trying to say here? 
I felt really like I had really studied the Sun Records a lot when I was in the Blasters because we did some of those songs and and I was really drawn to Luther Perkins' guitar because you know again like Lee Allen just a simple idea played with with you know confidence and it was sexy <laughs> um, so so when Johnny and June entered the studio. June came in first and I'm sitting there with my Gretsch guitar and she walks right up to me and says, is that a Gretsch guitar? My mama had a Gretsch guitar. I was like, really? I didn't know <laughs> a Gretsch guitar. I thought it was a Gibson. And then we started having this whole long conversation and she immediately broke the ice. And then, and John was, uh, Mr. Cash was kind of shy. You know, he was sort of in the back he didn't know any of us and he's like oh guys i'm sorry i got a little sinus infection i may not be singing too well today and then but then we got right to work you know it was no it was all about the work so i think that was the thing you know i mean june was so easy to connect with that it sort of made everything cool with him and i think that's probably a big part of their relationship right there is that she was a great buffer um, between him and, and the rest of the world. Yeah, and, and really, it wasn't. It was between his image and the rest of the world because he was interesting. Just, yeah, who he got. but you know, you see Johnny Cash. It's like, oh my god, all your ideas about who he is, you know, which may or may not be true. But it's like sure, but it's true for you if that's your ideas about it. You know, yeah, it's perceptions, but, reality. Yeah, but as soon as he he started working you know as soon as he was it wasn't about us anymore it was about him trying to learn these songs and deliver these songs and i remember the the other guys in the band were kind of they were nervous they were more insecure than i was about it and and the drummer actually had been drinking um so <laughs> which, is, kinda, which is always great to do when you're nervous yeah. oh my god <laughs> And and he was being kind of belligerent, which was his problem anyway. But um, I t I sort of took I took responsibility for the music. I I decided okay, you know I'm not gonna I'm not in this band anymore. I'm here to work for this man and try and deliver something that he can use. And um, and that's one of my that's actually one of the musical moments I'm most proud of. And you can hear it. It's on the, um, unearthed box set of American recordings. There's two songs. There's T for Texas, which is the full band. And it really, I'm really proud that I was able to, I mean, it's like a, it's a blues record. You know, we, we made a blues record with Johnny cash. If you hear that the harmonic, Monica solo is ripping. I'm playing this sort of R.L. Burnside style guitar, and you know, were you playing your harmony? Because I've seen you have a harmony. I love those things, man. I think on that one, I was actually playing my Gretsch. It's a Gretsch uh, Electromatic. It's a late '50s. Uh, I have one pickup. I put another one on it. It's those weird Diarmen. Yeah, uh, which are the uh, which are the ones from the harmonies? Those are great, man. Yeah, yeah, the they're, same. Oh. Uh, they're amazing. Yeah. And I was playing through my little Gibson Lancer, which is like a 112. It's like a deluxe, but a mm. Gibson Tweed, which killer amp, just killer. Um, so so T for Texas is the one song. Yeah. And then we did the song called The Devil's Right Hand by Steve Earle. Mm. And uh, that one was interesting because uh, basically Rick Rubin didn't like anything but the guitar. So he took everything off of it. So when you hear it on Unearth, it's just me and Mr. Cash, which I guess is how they were listening to it in the control room. Because they've stripped everything anyway. Yeah, because the wow. drum playing way too hard, and you know, and it's it's funny. It, it, I mean, it totally works, and I'm and and I didn't get to hear any of this back until after Mr. Cash died. This is like twelve years later. That's wow. the that's that's the rough part about this business mm. is you know no one's going to send me a tape. I'm not going to call up Rick Rubin and say, "Can you send me outtakes?" Like <laughs> <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so 
so anyway, the, that was, I guess, to answer your question, how do you deal with famous people is just you focus on the work. And I, I think what was harder was uh, the session before that, that that group did with Rick Rubin, where he brought us in to play with a rock star was with Mick Jagger when Mick was doing his wandering spirit record. And he just, he had come and sat in with us a couple times at the King King and really liked us. Um, you know, he makes a great blues singer. So, and we knew a lot of the songs that he liked. So we would do some slim Harpo, some little Walter, some muddy waters, so we made this record with him in like a day. And um, the story goes, uh, I don't want to piss anybody off, but the story goes that he You can piss somebody for- off here as long as, it's, as long as you're not going to get any shit for it. <laughs> this is the right place to do it, Smokey. <laughs> it's too old to come looking for me. No, uh, that's not true. Um, but uh, he, he, the, the story I heard was that he played it for Keith and Keith loved it, so he decided he didn't like it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, but it did come out on a bootleg in Japan. <laughs> Speaking of dysfunction. <laughs> yeah, there you go. God. But it, wow. it's, it's, it's a good record. And on and that one, it was really freaky because we were going, you know, his band from that record was all set up. Their shit was all set up. And so we just sort of had to cram in amongst without moving their gear too much so i had my of course i didn't have a lot of stuff i just had one guitar and one amp at the time but uh it was la- the layout in the studio was such that mick was literally standing next to me like i could reach out and touch him was it and, weird and it was weird it, it was like and then but the weirder part is all right you, the band's rocking you got your headphones on all of a sudden it sounds like a Rolling Stones. Here's Mick Jagger singing. When you hear that voice, it's just like it. It's like oh my god. It, it was weird enough that he's standing there, but when you hear the voice, it's just like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. Is that yeah. Is this really happening? And he was very cool with us. Like he he was just one of the guys, and I think he enjoyed it. Probably for him, it felt like the good old days being in a blues band and like we listened to the muddy waters version and you know, he'd get his lyrics and we'd figure out our parts and we'd go and we'd do it. So it wasn't a lot of thought. It was just like, this is what we do. So again, it was one of those things where the work just sort of took that starstruck thing away, you know, that's awesome. You didn't want to like sit there and stare at him. (laughs) You know, you got to try to sort of be cool. (laughs) Yeah. But it's gotta be, I mean, cause you're, I'm, you know, you've heard him sing maybe a thousand songs to you. Yeah. It's got to you know. be like very surreal, I would imagine. And, and it was cool hearing, you know, you're doing a Muddy Waters cover, but then here's Mick's voice. And it's like, oh, yeah, like he's is the same as Mr. Cash. It's like, you know, doing Hurt. It's like as soon as he opens his mouth, it's his song. Like he owns it. Like. You know, Mick singing 40 Days and 40 Nights. As soon as he says 40 Days and 40 Nights, it's a Rolling Stones song. It's yeah. no longer a Muddy Waters song. It's just, it, it just, it's like magic. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, that just goes to show you, I mean, how uh, indelible the, you know, their stamp is on, on, us musically and, and on our culture, our society, you know, to have in, in, in taken that in like that. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. I mean, what's the, the likelihood of that even happening, you know, yeah. in the, uh, it's weird. You mentioned Hurt. Can you talk about that? Because you sang on that song, which is a really beautiful song. You sang on that, didn't you? Well, yeah, there's a, there's actually some debate now about that I've, I've heard. Um, here's what happened. We were, we were working on another song and, and Rick called us all into the control room and the way it worked on in those, in those later years with uh, Mr. Cash was he was recording all the time. Um, So he recorded in, in at home and outside of Nashville where he lived with his neighbors who were, you know, Marty Stewart and, Randy Scruggs. I mean, there were some neighbors, but he, yeah, he had all these 
uh, recordings. And so Rick was trying to, you know, work with some of the ones he already had and maybe do some new ones. So as we were taking a song that he had already done and stripping away some of the more fancy guitar parts, because, you know, Mr. Cash's voice was kind of, uh, he didn't have a lot of strength, so the guitars needed to be more subdued. So Rick was sort of reducing everything, you mm. know, to give him the space. So we were adjusting some of those tracks. So um, we had been doing that, and then Mr. Cash showed up to hear what we had been doing, and then it was like, okay, well, let's all come in the control and listen to the song we're going to try tomorrow. And um, – it was the live version of Hurt, which I don't know if you know it, but it ends with this like crazy, like industrial keyboard noise. I don't know that. I know the studio version. I don't know the live version. This thing. And, and the thing is, Rick likes to listen to everything really loud. <laughs> so, you know, and, and Mr. Cash at this point, he's pretty old and he's kind of a little, not blind, but his vision's pretty bad. So you'd get this sort of glazed over look in his eyes. He'd be staring out into space and you're just thinking, what the fuck is he thinking? <laughs> you know, we're listing this fucking song so loud. And um, it ends and he sort of goes, there's this sort of silence in the room. He goes, well, that sounds like something I would have written about 20 years ago, you know, and you could tell like, okay, he's in. So he left. And then it's like, okay, uh, oh, no, before he left, Rick says to me, well, can you figure out what key is would be good for him? So I got with him for just a few minutes, and, you know, we just sort of tried to see where it would fit. So we figured out a key. And so he left. So then we decided, okay, well, we're here. We know what to do. Let's track it. And Rick says to me, okay, well, you know, you want to sing it? And I, I said, no. And he says, well, if you don't, I would. I said, okay, I'll do it. But then I guess uh, that, so, so that's the version that Mr. Cash learned it. But I guess his son, John Carter, had also sung a version of it, which I didn't. Okay. So, so there's been some debate on, you know. Who on whose who's voice is actually on there. <laughs> but I know I sung it. Yeah, yeah. I worked really hard on trying to figure out how he would fit. Because I knew at that point how little air he had to work with. So we tried to break it up in such a way so he could learn it in the right, you know, so we could record it in the way that would fit how he would sing it. Sure. So that's all it was. But the thing about singing, I had I had always sung back up vocals i mean i didn't sing in the blasters but in my other bands my blues bands i would sing maybe you know the lester the harmonica would harmonica player he would sing most of the songs and then i'd sing one or two songs a night so i was never really like a lead singer but you know i would do like once in a while a song i never thought of myself really as a singer but having to do that for mr cash made me think, okay, well, maybe this is something I should keep doing. And, and it was more about the songs than the singing. So here I was learning all these songs for him, these great songs. I mean, we were, there were so many songs we didn't get to record yet, you know, that we had on the list. So many good, good songs. And it was just like watching him learn the songs and watching him inhabit a song. Like it was almost – like he would put on a mask or a coat and become this character. It was still him, but it was just, it was just so fascinating. And it was such a in, rush. In know? what way would he like, was it his, his, his voice, his, what, what gave you that feeling? Is of the lyrics. He would just reinterpret him in his own way. But, it, but I guess we were the, we were the coat. We were the mask, you know, the, the music, Part. Yeah, you were the catalyst, you guys. Yeah, we were kind of creating a, a scene, and then he would just give the reality to it. Like his voice was the truth. It's like whatever he said was rang true. So no matter what we did, as long as it fit the song, he gave it that legitimacy. You know, so 
um, you had to be really careful. Like there was no room for banjo. Like I, I had brought a banjo. It was never used. No one, you know, they, the rule was no banjo on a Johnny cash record. You know, wow. you can't, you know, it's not, it's just not going to happen. Um, because of that, that truth, uh, it's hard. It's a hard thing to it, integrity. That's the word I'm looking for. So, no matter what he said, it, it was believable because he had this integrity. And, right. and then the thing of like, you know, um, we did the, the Bob Marley's Redemption song, which is an amazing song. Yeah, um, real pretty. And he, he just, you know, it, it, I mean, here's Johnny Cash singing about being a slave. And it was totally believable. It's like you don't question it for a second. You know, I don't know. It, it was just this power. Um, it goes maybe to go back to that confidence thing. Yeah, I bet that's you that's some of it. Yeah, and just re- being able to relate to something mm. and just okay, it may not be. You know, he may not have been an African slave on a slave ship, but he was a water boy on a road crew you know yeah he had, he had he could relate and he could deliver it with that authority um anyway it's it you know i i just got hooked on the thing of like learning these songs and telling these stories and, and when he died i missed it so much because my whole life at that point was about like what song would Mr. Cash want to do. I had a, I had a list of Beck songs and Tom Waits songs I was ready to present to him, and you know, what would Johnny do? Yeah, there was a there was a really great X song I wanted him to try and because I knew he, it as long as he heard it, he would get it, you know. But we just never got there. There wasn't enough time, you know. Yeah. If June had lived longer, he would have lived longer. But I mean, it's amazing he did as much as he did because he was really he was action. really ill. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, wow, man. Thanks for sharing. That was a really cool story, man. And I'm glad you got to do And then after that, you sang now. You sang now. Yeah, so so I I decided, well, these songs need to be done and uh you know, I I also wanted to keep playing western swing cuz it's something that I love. So I started this band and um it's just been great. It's cuz it's got, you know, I play every week, so it gives me, you know, I can keep my chops together. I can keep learning new songs. I, I bring in a new song every week. Man, well, let's talk. talk yeah, let's talk about this. Talk about your swing band. Talk about what you what you're doing now that you're excited about. Well, the the swing band, we it's um, we we play in this really cool old bar in Brooklyn called Sonny's Bar. It's been around since the turn of the century, the last century, and it's just like you're. St- you're not in 2018 at all. It's like, <laughs> 40. and, uh, you know, it's just a neighborhood bar and we started playing there just because there was nothing going on there and we needed a place to sort of practice. Um, I think we had one rehearsal and that was it. And now we just play every week. Uh, and so the locals hang out there and people dance. There's a dance floor and, um, So uh, having been a dancer and having, uh, as most musicians do, but many of them don't know it, the need to play for dancers, because that's... That's interesting. What do you mean by that? Well, this music that we call rock and roll or R&B, even the blues, it's really made for people to dance. Maybe not the blues so much, but... Um, you know, that's our role as musician is part of our role as musicians is to bring people together and make them forget their inhibitions and their troubles. Yeah, man. You know, couples, you know, it's a, it's an opportunity for couples to get to know each other. It's like, are you going to follow? Or are you going to lead? It's a really important social ritual that's been cut off. And uh, what couples know, getting to know each other? Yes, sadly, but true. <laughs> it's true, and but hell, and uh, you know, especially 
put a little alcohol in there and God bless can- alcohol, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I feel, I feel as a musician, it's part of my responsibility as, as a musician who loves dance and loves, and as a swing musician who mm. understands that swing music is dance music. Mm. So if, if you play for dancers, you're just going to play better. It's, that's all there is. If I see a couple dancing and and I know that they're feeling it, I'm going to feel it even more. And and if they're not feeling it, then I know that I'm not doing my job. Something's right. wrong, you know. So it's it's been a great experience. And it's week after week, we get different people come in. There's definitely a shortage of men who can dance or who want to dance. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I'm one of them. And this is not a, a high pressure scene. That's what I like about it. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, I, the only thing is sometimes I have to get on the microphone and say, okay, guys, put your cell phones down, put your beer down. You want your hands free so you can catch the lady if she falls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's cool that you do that, man. Because it, it's, it, it's especially in a local bar like that, it's not intimidating at all. Everybody's just there to hang out and relax for the most part and vibe on the music especially. So that's really good that you do that. I bet it's like a big, you definitely, I could see like I would, you know, if you did that and I was there, I'd shepherd me onto the dance floor, whereas otherwise I certainly wouldn't be there. Well, it's, it, we've been really lucky that, um, I mean, I've been really lucky that the guy who I started the band with lived around the corner from this bar because it's a really sweet place, you know, and there it's reminds me of that place, the King King that I used to play in LA, the old one, they moved and it wasn't so good, but, uh, it's, you know, you find a place that's a neighborhood bar that's, you know, that's comfort, that's a home, but it's a lot of freaks, you know, (laughs) those places are a few are between and uh so i just latched onto that place. I'm like oh my god i this is my home and uh and it's just i take it seriously i go every week and i i and my band is really great they're you know uh the problem with swing music is a lot of jazz players uh overplay and they don't you know you got to be a good player to play swing and so usually you get these guys who are way overqualified and they don't. So, when, but swing, like I said, is for dance. So, you know, as slick as the drummer is, if that backbeat isn't there, it's the dancers aren't going to feel it, you know? Mm. So it's, it's been great to find musicians who get it, you know, who it's not about chops. It's about feeling, man. It's about feel. How far is that? How- Boogie, you know, is more relevant now than it's ever been. <laughs> yeah, man. How, how far is the bar from from your place where you live? Is it a big hall or is it a couple of subway uh, stops? Or? It's well, I have a car, and um, it's uh, the bar is in Brooklyn, and I live in Hoboken, so I have to. Oh, actually- okay, I thought you lived in Brooklyn for some reason. Oh no, oh, but okay. you know, most of the work is in Brooklyn. Oh. You know, New York has changed; everything's drifted into Brooklyn. There's yeah. Not- not many many gigs in Manhattan even. Anymore. Well, it's funny because you and I grew up there, and you were saying about you know there's some freaks in the bar, and I started thinking, I'm like, shit, all the cool places that you had that kind of scene are just literally gone. I mean, just yeah. fucking zero. There's not. I mean, you go now, and it's you know, I used to get um, no, I forgot the name of the mag, like just New York Magazine, and because I I go there a couple of, once a year or so, and I grew up there, and I love taking my wife there. We have a, a lot of fun, and I'd always want to find out like what are the cool places to hang out. And now it's just some version of uh, oh DJ this or mixologist, and that means like twenty dollar drinks that have a lot of shit in there I don't want, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and like fucking uh, emo music or something like that that I don't want, man. But there's no like kind of cool places you could just go and like hang out and watch people anymore, man. Yeah. You know, it's really um, it's it's a little disappointing, man. To, you know, no, it, it is, and I that's why I'm I feel so precious about this place because I really feel like it's uh, you know, uh, I mean just seeing how my friends when they show up there, how much they're, they freak out my friends from LA, you know, and they're like, Oh my God, there's nothing like this. I mean, there are actually a couple of 
bars now in LA and there's more and more happening every day, but it is, it is something we have to fight for. And I, I mean, that's the thing that Jimmy Weibel uh, taught me in the end because his wife uh, finally died and then he was left, uh, you know, at like 80 and still wanting to play. And so he would find these little gigs for himself. He played at this tea house in Pasadena or he, there was this Thai restaurant that he liked to go to. And he asked them, he said, would you want some music? You know, I'd love to play here. And they let him play like, you know, a couple times a week. And, you know, of course I think that they probably were bummed because it was just guitar players who didn't need anything <laughs> to be played. But, but no, but he, he showed me that, yes, you can, you can create a gig, you know, you, you don't have to wait for the gigs to come to you. You can, you get part of your job as a musician. If you want to play, you have to make it happen. You yeah. know, you have to find your audience. You have to find, find a place in your neighborhood that'll let you, if, if you want to play for people, you can make it happen. You know, man, I, I mean, that's a really valuable lesson, especially the people listen to this. And I will tell them as a guy who's been in sales for over 30 years, you're not going to get a yes every time. But if you don't ask, you're never going to get the yes. You know, so knock on some doors and ask, and you're going to get someone, probably a lot more people than you think, to say, man, we'd love that. You know, um, that's a really good lesson, man. Thank you for uh, putting that out there. Like Jimmy, you know, he sh again, he was just like, I mean, I couldn't believe it. The guy's like 83 and he's playing in some Thai restaurants. Like, how'd you get this gig? He's like, oh, I just asked him. I was there like, you go. <laughs> right, right. Well, shout out to Sonny's Bar in Red Hook, man. Yes. Hey, yeah. let me ask you this, Smokey. What are some of the bigger obstacles you've had to overcome throughout this journey, either like personally or music related or business related? Because I know life, as you know, is not for the weak. Yes. Um, I would say my biggest advice and, and the thing that's the op biggest obstacle is just not to, I mean, if you're a musician, you're probably a pretty sensitive person. You know, most musicians, if they're not sensitive at first, they have to become, they're, <laughs> if yeah. they're good musicians, they're sensitive, you know? And so the thing is to not take it personally. I mean, we are in a time when, Music has been so devalued um, just in my lifetime. I mean, just as a professional, my day rate hasn't changed in 20 years. And it's, I don't, I rarely ever get it anymore. I have to get, you know, I do it for half what I did 20 years ago. That's how bad it is, you know. And I got in at the very end of when the recording business was actually, you can still make good money doing it. I feel like those, that's over, you know, music with with the whole downloading thing and just the gr the top heavy greed of the 90s 80s and 90s sure this has just been gutted you know so as far as uh making a living it's probably hasn't been this hard in a hundred years or so or 80 years or so so um but it's not my fault um <laughs> uh, and and the fact that you know, the people who are running the quote unquote mainstream business are so myopic. All they can see is the latest hit. So they're only going to sign someone that sounded just like whatever made money last week. The last you know? guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's so the odds are so against us, but underneath that, I know that humans love music they need it it's a tonic and so it does have more value and we need to value our own um you know our own uh power in there and we need to keep keep that in mind and so that's the hardest thing is to not take it personally like you know especially i'm 58 you know and i I see, I mean, I've never been told, oh, you did get hired because you're too old, but you know, you're, you're, you're always going to be too something. You're too short. You're too tall. You're too old. Yeah. You know, you're too white. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's like a window of like uh, five years where the twos like might go away and that's it. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's the thing, you know, just don't take it personally, you know, just know that try and be open, try and keep 
keep the as the Hopis say, keep the door on the top of your head open, so that new ideas can get in, and um, and also to have good peripheral vision because you never know when something's going to take your attention, and that might be your new direction. So, mm. um, but yeah, the obstacle is like. You know, I worked so hard at this. I'm an expert. Why doesn't everyone else value it? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, do you think things are going to turn? Uh, well, they're definitely turning. Um, I, I recently, um, so it was a terrible book, but I, I, I read this biography of Lonnie Johnson that this guy is like this, prof, some professor did a, Thing about Lonnie Johnson, but I learned I'm a huge Lonnie Johnson fan, and I learned a lot from his life. You know, he he I don't know if you know who mm -hmm. he is. Lonnie Johnson was one of the most important uh, guitar players of his generation. He was born around the turn of the century. He's from New Orleans. He played on um, he played with uh, major recordings by Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong. Um, he his career sort of disappeared and then he came back in the early fifties when he was in his fifties with the song tomorrow night that then, uh, Elvis became Elvis's sort of template for his. Wait a minute. Story. Didn't, didn't, um, Nick Gravenides and Mike Bloomfield, I think remade that. I just hear Nick Gravenides lyric in my head singing that song tomorrow yeah. night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but he's, his guitar playing is just, so superb like he did uh a series of jazz duets with eddie lang um which were kind of radical because they were one guy was black the other was white and that was unheard of in the 30s yeah uh, i do know that and he played on a lot of great blues records uh too so he was in jazz and blues but uh, i forget where i was going with this about his oh well his his whole thing was that he came from a huge family that were all musicians. They had a family string band and they, this was in new Orleans and they played in the streets. They played on the street corner as little kids, but they would play parties. They would play weddings. They would play whatever. That's where we're back to. The record business has pretty much gutted, you know, the, the whole singer songwriter thing has imploded. Now we're back to minstrel time. It's like really, um, I mean, I'm, I did like three weddings this month. I've got a bunch more coming up. These are the gigs that keep my band afloat, you know, yeah. party weddings. Um, so, you know, the whole rock and roll dream or singer songwriter dream of success, that's great when it happens, but it's so fleeting and so rare is that now it's just about, you know, how many songs do you know? How, how, how versatile are you? How good are you an entertainer so it's back to entertainment you know it's um i mean if you're lucky enough to get in a popular band and and play for big crowds that's great you know but um i think it's things of we're really back to square one in a way i wonder if you know the internet seems to have the fact that people don't pay pay for music anymore is it's really kind of the thing that's that's the financial engine that has been shut down yeah you know consumer paying for stuff and now everybody you know youtube is like you know when we were kids we'd turn on wplj or whatever radio or new or whatever or you know abc 77 whatever i don't know what they had out in la but now it's like people go to youtube yeah you know to to, to turn on the quote radio and um i don't i i don't know how that's going to be remediated i hope it does for all for all of you guys i I don't see any hope in that. Uh, yeah, hope is not a good business strategy. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I think the thing with YouTube, I don't blame YouTube. I, what I do blame is the imbalance before the internet. How things got so imbalanced with so much money in the record business, top down. You know, yeah. it did really trickle down, and then the people who were just, you know, who were unsigned. I mean, yeah, it's all kind of now it's going to be leveled out and it's back to like, uh, and also you said the thing about how no one's paying for music, but 
what you're paying for now, what people want to pay for is a, is a real experience. And I think because young people, everything's so easily accessible. Yeah. But but they want experience. They want like something authentic um, because everything's so virtual. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I know I do. I, I love going out and seeing music, you know, and I always support local stuff here. But um, it, yeah, I, hope, I just hope that somehow this swings around a little bit. I don't know the answer. I was just curious what your take on it was. We're all in the same boat. It's like, uh, you know, we have to remind ourselves and each other that the authentic stuff is what's what's good. And and like I said, playing in Sunnies and seeing people dance it makes me feel so much better to know that I'm making them shake their butts, you know, and maybe, I mean, I had one couple, a couple months ago, they were practically during the break. They're practically having sex on my amp. You know, I had to keep <laughs> you had to wipe it down when you got home. <laughs> 59 Rick, that baby's going to be born on a, you know, conceived by 59 Rick and Parker. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, Put that that's in your awesome. resume. <laughs> that's you know, it, I, I play with these African guys, and and we've talked. I, I've been you know trying to understand how music plays into their culture, and you know the, it's they have these guys called griots who are yeah. sort of the the community uh, feeds them and takes care of them, and they don't have regular jobs. But when, it, when there's a death or a birth. They show up, they sing the history of that child's family. They know the, all the stories and they're responsible for keeping track of the stories. And that's, to me, that relates to Johnny Cash. That's his, he felt a responsibility to keep these songs alive. You know, he, I mean, he was a great songwriter himself, but he was just as interested in the, the storytelling because it's, that's where the comfort is, you know, besides just the music, it's those stories you want to, you know, they're all, they're there for a reason. And just like in Africa, the griots are, the tribe takes care of them because they value what the griots give them. Um, so we have to find a way to, to, to honor and value, uh, what music can do. Um, and that's, again, why I feel so blessed that I've gotten to work with such great songwriters. I mean, I, I really, I, I'm just completely blessed. Uh, I mean, Tom Waits, Beck, uh, you can't ask for better songwriters. No, just a class guys, man. Like, you know, um, wow. You know, I must've done something right in a past life. Yeah, man. Very much so. <laughs> Hey, let's switch over to talk about some gear for a few minutes. I was curious. You have some really cool guitars. Um, I was curious, which what's your go-to guitar right now maybe and what other ones would round out your top few? Well, for, for different groups or different projects, I have different guitars. For the Western Swing Band, I have a 1938 Gibson Charlie Christian guitar. And that guitar is gorgeous, man. <laughs> I've had that guitar for about, I bought it from Norm's Rare Guitars in the early 90s, and I can't believe it's still in pretty good shape. And it just, those guitars, just they got it right, you know? <laughs> the first time out, they got it right. And it's funny, because I am I know Bucky Pizzarelli a little bit, and I went Why to his I house. Why do that name? Oh, he's one of the great all-time uh jazz and session guitarists he played with sinatra he like jimmy weibel he was okay i met him through jimmy weibel basically um and his son john is a great jazz guitar player and singer also um so you probably know of him too but bucky he played with joe venuti and he started back in the day where you had to play banjo and guitar and he played in big bands but this guitar maker I know, we went over there to show him some guitars, and, and he just started reminiscing. He's like, did you ever play a Gibson ES-150? And I was like, yes. He's like, those were the best guitars. I was like, yes. Because <laughs> um, it just it sounds – it's got an acoustic sound, but when you turn it up, you can get some real meat on it. If you turn the tone off, it really growls. And, it, I mean, it's what Charlie Christian was using, so you can hear it on those records – 
T-Bone Walker on his early records, it's the same guitar. So it's very versatile, and I just like the way it feels. It's light. And it's, it's not super thick either, man. It's It looks really reasonable. Yeah, I mean, it's you can... I mean, you could play it acoustically. It sounds like a normal arch top acoustic. So yeah, it's it's a very it's a very perfect guitar. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, so for the swing stuff and jazz stuff, I like that. Um, not jazz for swing. Jazz would be a whole different thing. But uh, my other guitar that I go to for everything else. Uh, that's not acoustic is my harmony stratotone. Oh, I love that. And I, ha- I've had, uh, over the years, I've had four of them. Um, but this particular one I bought, it was at a pawn sh- at a music shop in, um, outside of Santa Barbara. And I, it was on the wall. It was, it was on a case up on the wall. Like it had been there for like 20 years or something. And I, it was through Rick Holmstrom that I actually got hip to these guitars. Um, and it's funny. I don't think Rick plays them anymore. No, he's he most- doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> he's just playing. He plays mostly a Strat, and I think he may have a hollow bot, like a 335-ish kind of thing that he plays once in a while. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> but that used to be his thing. And um, So is that a double, two pickups or one that you have? No, single pickup. It's a single cop- pickup. The copper, copper, yeah, I've seen the copper. This was a single cutaway. I think it's from '54. Oh, that's and, an older one, yeah. And the and the neck through goes all the way to the tail piece, like it's one piece of wood. So it really resonates great. Um, and that guitar, it just it's so versatile. And it's funny because I did the session with this really great African guitar player, and we had all these guitars. There was a Birdland, a Tele, a Strat, all this stuff sitting there i was like take your pick and he went straight for the stratotone which i couldn't believe because it's really beat up and it's like the guy oh, it sounds like, so good man uh, really it's it's such a great guitar and then for acoustic i actually have a guitar right here i'm going to show it to you yeah, man. <laughs> it's this is an amazing guitar it's um wow what is that it's this guy roger boris who i met through jimmy weibel He's uh, he was a, an apprentice with uh, well not an apprentice he he worked with um, Jimmy D'Aquisto. The okay, great yeah, jazz. yeah, For, out of out of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Long Island. Okay, he, oh, yeah. He, originally, he were uh, Jimmy was uh, John D'Angelico's apprentice. Right. He took over the shop. There's that's an amazing whole story about that. I won't go into that, but uh, w- at some point this guy Roger started working with Jimmy and they were, they designed a guitar together for Barry Galbraith, uh, called the B one twenty, I think B one twelve. Anyway, around that time, uh, Jimmy D'Aquisto was making guitars for Joe pass. And, um, Joe would come in and talked about how he wanted an acoustic nylon guitar, but with a jazz neck. So, so the neck has a bit of a radius to it. So it really feels like it really feels more like a jazz guitar than like a a nylon classical guitar, which can be really. It's a beautiful guitar, man. I love that guitar. I like the binding around it. I like the, uh, the shape of it. It's like, it's not, it's almost like, like a jazz box sort of. It is. It's it's got a bit of an arch to it. And then he did this cool thing with this bridge. Yeah, that is cool, man. So uh, this is a tailpiece, like from a jazz, you know, style uh, arch top. But then it's got this little bridge here. So there's, they're actually almost touching. But it's, so it really feels like an arch top. But it's got this beautiful nylon sound. And it and the pickup on it is great. Man, that that great. sounded so pretty, just you strumming it right there, man. Really nice guitar. When Do you play a lot of acoustic? I, I do. Um, I, and this guitar is sort of a, a new acquisition, actually. Rogers, I have, it's his guitar still. I'm borrowing it, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's I, great because it's, um, you know, I do, I do some uh, Bossa Nova stuff sometimes, and like I've been doing a lot of weddings, and so okay. it's perfect for that. It, it has a very, 
uh, soothing sound that people like. But I can, with a pickup. That's you know, your playing, play. man. That is the word I was looking for. It's like very soothing when you play. <laughs> yeah, it's really like whatever you're playing. It's even when you were playing banjo on that Tom Waits <laughs> cut, I was like, man, this thing is just, it's like you're very. Um, soothing i don't know that's the way to say it you're very in tune with your instrument it's just like you know very easy going vibe and as a listener i really dig that man it's 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 not hard to like you know it's it's real easy to to vibe on that man so thanks all right thank you um i wanted to talk a little bit about the players that i heard growing up yeah man let's do that got to see um because you know I, i was thinking about when you said soothing and, and a lot of that was a big part of the world that when I started playing guitar seriously, um, and well, when I got a car and I could go see guitar players. So that was in this like 76. So here I am in LA, 16 year old in 1976, who was playing around town? Who could I go see? It was Lee Rittenauer, um, Earl Clue, <laughs> wow, these all jazz guys, uh, Larry Carlton and Robin Ford, they would sometimes play together, but they also were playing around town. And uh, I I got to see Howard Roberts play a couple times, which was a real thrill. Wow, and then uh, Kenny Burrell, uh, and uh, and I got to see Joe Pass too, which was pretty amazing. So I was really lucky, but it's funny because those guys like Larry Carlton and, and Lee Rittenauer, like, you know, now I listen to those records. It's just so, they're so cheesy in like seventies, you know, but at the time those guys really had this, it, it was a period where fusion was still like, I don't know. It was, there was still a lot of beauty and, it wasn't just all chops, you know. They were very melodic players. Like Larry Carlton was a very melodic player. Um, I don't know. It's funny to think about that now because then, tw- then ten years later, when I was or twenty years later, when I was with Beck, those are the last people I would have been interested in. You know, then I was listening to, uh, you know, well, when I was in the Blasters, I, I. I told you I had to study all this different music. I got really into Bo Diddley. He's someone that. That's interesting, you know, because I've never really took a deep dive into his stuff because I thought it was always just the same, you know, oh, it'd just be a different version of a shuffle. But no, huh? No way. You got, uh, yeah, his his records are just incredible, especially the early, you know, the early chess records, just amazing. And, uh, you know, he's a good song, a great songwriter, but he really, uh, man, he just had a thing, you know, with that guitar. It had a character in it. Um, and the one who I really liked also, um, who sort of took a lot from Bo Diddley is Poison Ivy, who plays in the Cramps. Oh yeah, 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 man. You There's know what? A- um, I love, uh, I love some of that stuff. Um, I never forget. I was down in Bleaker Bob's, another store that's gone. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, when I first, I was probably you know ten, eleven, twelve, and I, I'm like, wow, what is this stuff? And it was the cramps. It was like Goo Goo Muck or something like that, yeah. you know. And it was that. And I'm supposed to. It's it's like the evolution. I'm, do you know who the Misfits are? Uh-huh. So I'm supposed to be hooking up with Doyle on this show, which would be pretty interesting to have him on the show. And I got Robin come Robin Ford coming in like next week. So I'm looking oh, forward. Wow. Yeah. So I got all these like talk about diversity going from Doyle to Robin, you know, to you to, you know, uh, uh, to Rick, you know, it's which is I love it. It's really cool. But uh I sorry, I didn't mean to take off. Yes, I know Poison oh. Ivy for sure. Yeah. Poison Ivy. So so like, you know, so I was listening to Robin when he was uh, you know, before he pl- was playing with Miles, and I remember I was I was a huge fan of Robbins, and then he went and played with Miles, and then I saw him play after that, and it was just like, oh my god, like, you know, he just like, I love the stuff he did with Miles. I thought it was phenomenal, man. Incredible, and then his yeah. playing his own thing after Miles was just incredible. Um, 
but I could dig that and then I could go and dig Bo Diddley or, or Poison Ivy. So, you know, I learned to sort of appreciate the less is more kind of thing. But yeah. I mean, I, Robin is always one of those supremely tasteful guy. And I, I think he's way underutilized in the studio scene. If, if I was a producer, I would be yeah. hiring him, you know, as much as possible because I think he's way more versatile than most people realize. I loved his playing as a teenager in the blues band when he was backing up Charlie Musselwhite, incredible stuff. And he really had that, uh, you know, he was in that T-Bone Walker tradition, you know, even though he was a young rock kid, he still had that. You could hear the roots of where he's coming from, you know, really well. Do you know him? Cause I'll tell him he's, you, uh, he's no, but I, I, my, my siblings do. I've met him, uh, but I don't really know him, uh, very well. My, my sister and brother know him because, um, they have mutual acquaintances, but I don't personally. <laughs> yeah. He, I, he, he doesn't overplay. That's one thing that's your hundred percent correct on. Yeah. And even when he's playing crazy fast, he does not overplay, not remotely. And he's always in tune and oh, yeah. his tone is impeccable, which is something I can't, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, but what are you playing out of your, to get your tone? It sounds great. Well, most of the time I just, uh, I, I mean, I, I usually use in the studio. I like, okay, this is a kind of a funny thing, but, um, there's this Gibson amp from the sixties called a Falcon. Okay. And it's, it's kind of like a deluxe reverb, similar size. Uh, but the, the cabinet was a little bigger. It's a little oversized cabinet. So it has a, a darker sound maybe a more low end hmm. but those are incredibly versatile amps and so on a lot a lot of the session stuff like for beck that was usually what i would go through is that uh, like an 18 watt amp or something or something 15? yeah something like that um it's a 112 not a very efficient speaker it's like a jensen or something but it's got a really great reverb and a really nice tremolo i love those in a uh, in an amp, oh yeah, yeah. Trem tremolo especially. It's such a gift to have that. And you know, uh, with different guitars, it it reacts differently, obviously. Um, and I don't, I'm not one for a lot of treble. I don't like to turn up the treble. But something I've noticed recently playing more swing and jazz stuff, and uh, kind of studying Wes Montgomery a little bit, is that he, I think he turned down the bass on his amp so he could turn it up the bass on the guitar. In other words, using more of the low end from the guitar and less from the amp. Sure. So if you, you kind of thin out the low end so that you can have that nice, warm, low middle that's really coming through. Um, I don't know if that's really what he did, but that's what it seems like to me. Man, I'm going to turn my bass down right now because I want to be like, <laughs> I'm trying it tonight. No, seriously, man, because you're a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> I assure you. So I might as well give it a shot. There's no you know, downside. It's funny because we were talking about Poison Ivy. I, I had a really great thing happen with her because um, she, she, the cramps and the blasters were friends. And um, so she called me up one time because we had met and we had talked about amps. And she said, oh, I'm in the studio. And I was wondering if you had a cool amp I could borrow. And I was like, sure. So I brought these three amps I had down there and we she played through them and it was really great because she said oh i like the speakers on this one but i like the front end on this one and she could hear all that you know and those guys play fucking loud on stage like i was blown away that she <laughs> could really hear. I, I couldn't hear it she could hear it and um and it was funny because right around the same time i had this amp that ry cooter uh, saw me play at some gig and he liked my amp. So he came up and talked to me and then I ended up bringing it over to his house and it was the same thing. He was like, Oh, well the, maybe with different speaker, this would be bad. <laughs> and it's like, how do you hear that? I don't even hear it. Like, what are you talking about? That's well, so now funny. I get it. You know, it took me a while, but so those Gibson Falcon amps from the sixties, I think it's a good balance. You know, it's the right amount of power, for that speaker and the right size cabinet for that amount of power and everything. So 
you know, and it's ch- they're cheaper. You can still find them on eBay for like six hundred bucks, whereas a, a '60s deluxe reverb uh, oh. would probably be like twenty five hundred yeah, or at more. Least, at know? least two grand minimum. Yeah, so so that's my go to studio amp. Now I I have uh, I was telling you I have this Rickenbacker. I'm obsessed with the old Rickenbacker amps, uh, not the transonic ones that led zeppelin used on that one tour <laughs> talks about it. but the ones from the late 50s early 60s they're usually gray or silver and i got this one i'm not sure what the model is called but it's it came with a 15 inch jensen that's what i have in my i have a 15 inch speaker and i love it oh well this this app was so i could tell that the speaker was not doing it justice so oh, i swap, swapped it out for a jbl d130 and now it's just my favorite for for the swing band especially it just it's got everything i need so that 15 inch jensen um, jbl it's an old one and um and it's it doesn't have any uh reverb it's got a really nice tremolo uh but the thing on those amps it has a sort of a brilliant Dial. Yeah, so it's a really nice high end, but it's not too piercing like a Fender. Hmm. It's it's really nicely EQ'd, so you you get enough of the brightness, but it's it's not going to hurt. <laughs> um, so you, where'd you pick that one up? Wow, that's a good question. I think I'm maybe I bought this one on eBay. I can't remember. I've been I've been collecting the Rickenbacker amps for a long time. Um, and and it was a Rickenbacker 215. That was the amp that Rye saw and decided he had to hear it in his house. And I ended up, when I brought it over and he heard it and was so, he w- he had this theory that it might be, uh, at the time he was trying to find the Elmore James amp. And he thought that it's possible that the, this was the closest thing he had heard. He thought it and might be Elmore James' actual amp? I don't know, but the model. Oh, the, okay. Getting that amp sound. Um, it had two Jensen 15s and these two little tweeters. So it was like a giant fucking Rickenbacker amp. And um, I ended up basically giving it to him in exchange for, you know, he hung out with me a few times, sort of lessons. Yeah, really, yeah. Sort of hanging out, you know, but I was happy to do it. I actually found another one of those amps a few years ago and um, and bought it from a guy in um, on Long Island and it's pretty cool. But the single fifteen is enough for me these days. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. But that uh, Rickenbacker in the late fifties, early sixties, they made these these amps with three six inch speakers in them that are amazing. I haven't even heard of a six inch speaker. I mean, unless it's a little. Or maybe it's an eight. No, no, I think it's a six. Yeah, and there, it looks like a showman head or something. But it's, I guess that was for steel guitar. They made a lot of their stuff for steel guitar. Hmm. Um, but and then they make a four ten, which is they called it a bass amp, but it's like a basement. Yeah, that thing is just smoking. It's killer rock amp, and uh, I use it occasionally with my band with the brazilian guys because i need a little extra power <laughs> with yeah. with the blasters what were you using that was on stage now that, that was interesting because when i first started off i really loved my gibson falcon tone and i thought it has a monitor output jack and i mm-hmm. thought well if i use this with a twin reverb i can have the same tone just louder but it that didn't really work and then i got into just using a twin reverb didn't really give me what I wanted. And then uh, at some point, Billy Zoom told me he was retiring and he wanted to sell his Brown concert amp. It's a 63 Fender concert Brown uh, faceplate with the, the volume knob is like three knobs in, which on those, it meant that they had a different kind of transformer than the other one. So you could actually add another speaker cabinet. Oh, wow. And so Billy had modified it. He added two more power tubes, and uh, but he wouldn't sell me the other speaker cabinet. <laughs> what the hell? 
typical Billy Zoom. He's like, well, I made that. I'm like, yeah, but it matches. He's like, yeah, I don't want to sell. I was like, ah. But so I ended up eventually getting a 15 inch JBL as the other speaker, and that okay. was so I had four tens and a 15. But by then, I was already had one foot out the door with that band. I used that um, that rig when I toured with John Doe. Uh, that was a good rig for that. Um, but yeah, I I tried using it again a, f- a few years ago with Beck. Uh, we went on a tour in 2011, and I I brought that out for the tour. But uh, his our stage volume had come down that it was like way too loud for that. I couldn't get enough balls with a low volume yeah you know, a little more and with beck the thing that was so crazy is that you know i had at least 20 pedals did you so really yeah uh, there was so many it was is that so was much, that what the music called for because you don't you don't come across as the 20 pedal guy to me absolutely so so much of the job i mean with the blasters i had no pedals yeah uh with with beck it was like you know on this part of the song it's these two pedals, but then here comes the B section. These have to go off, and you have to use the space shifter. But then for the next section, so it was really like a dance to try and do all those. And eventually I ended up on the last tour I did with him, I got one of those gizmos where everything's sort of preset. Like a, a, a Kemper or something like that? It, it's similar. It, yeah. it, it's actually called a gizmo, and oh. it was um, – it's got multiple pages of presets and it's an amazing unit. Oh yeah. If you got to do that, it's, it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. But it was still a challenge to get, cause there was so much. That was the thing with back. It, it's all, he would just, things would only last a short time and then he'd be on to a new sound all within the same song. Sure. And, uh, so it's it's pretty funny when you look at some of the live shows from the late '90s that we did, where we're just like furiously trying to get the sound in time, and it got more intense as he got, you know, as he as Pro Tools got more easy to use, he started getting even more crazy with the different sounds. Wow. So. <laughs> hey, um, just curious. I, you've been around with a lot of guitars. You ever is there like a holy grail of guitars for you or amps that you've played that man? If I could preserve this moment in time or this guitar, I'd rather have this than anything else. Well, other than the Stratotone and and that Rickenbacker amp that I mentioned, I I do have a an amp that it's well. There's two amps I have that I'm really are really special to me, and again. One of them I never use because I'm I don't play that loud anymore. But I have a, a fifty eight twin, full power mm-hmm. twin, tweed twin, that I bought from Larry Taylor, uh, who, the bass player from Canned Heat, who's one of my favorite guitar players. Actually, he, he, that band in general was such. You talk about a blues, a great blues band. Wow, those guys are awesome. I actually was in Canned Heat for about two weeks, and then Larry quit. So I didn't want to be in it without him. <laughs> watch it too, but uh, so I, I agree because I had to learn all that material and um, incredible. I mean, uh, Al Wilson is such a great guitar player and singer. I mean, they're all so good, and the records and and really, Larry Taylor is one of the unsung heroes. Um, I worked with him with Tom Waits, who's Tom's bass player. And he does, Tom uses him on guitar now every once in a while. I mean, I don't know what Tom's doing lately, but Larry did play some good guitar on uh, Tom's last couple records. So he's definitely someone that I I would recommend interviewing him because he's knows a ton about guitar. And he, he played with Jerry McGee, who's one of the great, rock guitar players you know larry they they backed up the monkeys they're on a bunch of the boys and heart produced stuff that the monkeys did well that's a name boys and heart that, that's a blast from the past man holy shit i yes. haven't heard that yeah that's funny man larry came up with the baseline of last train to clarksville you know he's he, but he's a great blues guitar player and um 
you know, he played he played bass for Kim Wilson. Like he's known as oh, a bass, wow. but he's this monster guitar player. Um, so yeah, I bought that 55, uh, 58 twin from him and immediately called me, wanted me to sell it back to him. I was like, no, <laughs> no I got it. It's mine. Did he do a thing where he, he gets like at least first right of refusal if you're going to let it go? Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> then I, I found this Standell amp that I really love. I found it on eBay, and it, I couldn't believe I was able to even find it. It's a it's a tube one. It's a, a 15 inch uh, JBL in there. It's from the late 50s. Uh, I think it's called the Artist 15. I'm not sure exactly, but the thing with those Standells and even the st- solid state ones that they made in the mid 60s that was the one that West Montgomery used. Um, They have this thing called um, uh, contour and it, what it is, it's like a filter. Um, So you can EQ out the unpleasant, you know, often with me, it's EQing out the low end so I can have more low end on the guitar. But those amps are so great for jazz, for something with, you know, even for distortion, it's good, but for something with a clean sound, especially in the studio, oh my God, a Standell amp is. What do is those wonderful. go for? Oh, I mean, you can't find them. They they stop making them. Of course, there's a guy who makes them now. Who I, I don't, I can't recommend the new ones because I I've never used them. I know Ry Cooter has one he likes, but um, you know the the one I had, I think I got for three grand but i've seen them for up around six. Oh gosh and the one i the one i found i had to replace the speaker i was lucky i happened to have a another jbl d130 so um but yeah that's for jazz and, six grand and you get to replace the speaker no, no, no three grand, three <laughs> no, grand. <laughs> but still three grand and you got to replace the speaker that's yeah. like ouch yeah. Wow. But it's, it's a really special amp. I've never seen another one. It's green, which I love. Yeah, and that the, is cool. The faceplate lights up. You know, it's got this little light underneath it. But I don't really bring that out on gigs because, um, you know, I have that Rickenbacker, which is a little more roadworthy. And, and yeah, that sounds like too gentle. You got to be too gentle with the stand out. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to bring that out on a gig. And then as far as other other guitars. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything here. Um, you know, I mean, I love my Gretsch Electromatic. Uh, I love those pickups, those DeArmond pickups. And I've been on this whole kick with um, this guy Bill Jennings, who's a he was a West Coast uh, jazz blues guitar player. He, I think, he might be the one who played on Honky Tonk him and Billy Butler, there's some confusion on who played, but he, he played on a bunch of like R and B instrumentals in the fifties. And he uses, a uh, a Gretsch with the, or the at least Ar- the photo. <laughs> yeah. With, with the, the Armands. but you can hear it. You can definitely hear it on the record. It's like, Oh yeah. I just I mean, love those pickups. They're like the best man. I mean, they're just, they just sound so good. You know, that's what, Billy Zoom, uh, you know, he had the Gretsch Sparkle Jet. That was his uh, guitar. And in fact, Gretsch made a signature model for him. And uh, I have one of those, and it's incredible. You know, it's. Uh, Dude, you're like an onion, man. Every time I think you've got shit tons of guitars here, man, the layers are coming off, Smokey. Uh, oh, my God. Good for you. I don't have my, my well, favorite pedal thing here. I wish I did. It's at home. I would show it to you. I've been using this, um, a Maestro G, I think it's GT2. It's Maestro was a, you know, is an effects pedal company from the sixties. I think Gibson might've owned them or they made stuff for Gibson, but they made these guitar effects units. They had fuzz octave, (laughs) like a filter, two notch filter, they had an Ottawa. Wow. It's kind of, they call repeat, which is like a really harsh tremolo. So it's like, ah, 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 <laughs> totally cuts off. And then it has like 
four percussion instruments, like a clave. This is all on one effect? Yeah, it's a one unit that's like this big, and it's got colored buttons on it. It's called the Maestro GT2, I think. And I'm, it's from the late 60s. Uh, Zappa used it a lot. So for Zappa's fuzz tone, I think, you know, Maestro fuzz was their most famous thing. So this had that plus the octave. And actually, they made them for horns, too. So the horn players in Zappa's band used those. You can see there's a there's a thing he did at either German or English TV in the late sixties where he's got one and the horn players have them. They're all on these little stands, but, um, that guitar player, Blake Mills, I don't know if you yeah, know out him. in the West coast. Yeah. I know who he, he is. He had one on a session uh, years ago that we were doing. And I was like, Oh my God, that's got all the sounds I've been looking for. And I immediately so you found one, found e- one on eBay. eBay. Yeah. I use it all the time. Nice. I think there was, there was one up the other day for about 500 bucks. You know, you ever see some of those old, um, um, you know, the big muffs, the original big muffs, they go for like same thing, like a really high, I mean, yeah. and yeah. it's funny because I'll talk to some guys, you know, our age and guys like you and they'll be like, oh yeah, I've got four of them. Because, you know, guys like, you know, professional players, you know, they you know, they buy three, four of the same. Oh, I love this one. So let me get three, four of them. And they're like, oh yeah, I have three of them or four of them from the, you know, the late sixties. And it's like, you know, but they, you know, they're not looking apart with them. It's not a, it's, it's an asset, you know, that they could use yeah. to make sounds with. So I think, uh, Jay Maskus from dinosaur junior. Yeah. Has, like, Does he, he's, he's got he, some great fuzz tone, man. Yeah. Supposedly he has like some big muff. That's like the Holy grail that, you know, people keep offering him more and more money for because there's some special thing about it. But yeah, he's one of those guys who probably has hundreds of them. <laughs> he plays with a, with a lot of fuzz. So he's got to have loads of fuzz pedals. He's not dependent on one pedal. That guy for sure, man. No. And I think a, a lot of his thing is just, he plays so fucking loud. Yeah. He does play very loud show lately, but Oh my God, I was like, Whoa, where, where'd you see him? Uh, there was a Dinosaur Junior reunion show last year somewhere in New York. I went to see. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was amazing. He still has it, you know. He's and it's funny. I, I when I listen to him play, I'm like, okay, there's something in his playing that I know what it is. And then I figured it out the next day. I was like, it's the James Gang. He's like channeling some Joe Walsh shit. I know it. And then. I, I I actually went back and listened to a dinosaur Jack record. And I was like, yeah, that's it. It's like, he's got, it's like Joe Walsh coming through, coming through it's, Seattle. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a, I like, I like dinosaur Jr. They have good stuff, man. Yeah. Hey, uh, desert Island discs in no particular oh, okay. order, no particular order at all. And just for now, I mean, you could change tomorrow. What would be your uh, top three, your knee jerk reaction for right now? Yeah. I would say these are going to be pretty esoteric, but uh, any of the new Lost City Ramblers uh, early records. So if you don't know about them, Is that you got Western get, Swing. No, they're they're really more folk and old time music, but again, they're doing exactly what I wanted to do with Miss or we were doing with Mr. Cash. They're keeping the old songs alive. They they would travel around and um, they were multi instrumentalists. Um, Mike Seeger was sort of the I guess the ringleader. Pete Seeger's younger brother. And if if you really I, the video I would recommend the most. There's a Mike Seeger um, sort of history of the string instruments that he does where he it's a black and white film from the early 60s where he's you know he starts on the fiddle plays guitar banjo ends up doing auto harp like this beautiful (laughs) that's wild i mean they're like those records that any of those records they made are so wonderful and um it's kind of like they were doing you know like the harry smith anthology of american folk music they were actually that's kind of what they were they were just collecting songs and you know keeping the old traditions alive so their records are just phenomenal so any of their early records and then i would say um 
Mose Allison sings. Wow, I knew they. Were, I knew these were going to be like not like <laughs> off the top shelf uh, pop charts. Mose <laughs> Allison sings. Um, it's not necessarily that record of Mose Allison, but his early. You know, I just love the guy. I, I've been learning so many of his songs lately. I mean, way before he was ill and died. But um, you know, I was a fan of his growing up and saw him play in the 70s he, he's just there's something about him that just connects you know and, yeah. and that record Allison sing sings he does covers too it's not just originals but yeah he's one of my big heroes these days and i just love his hearing his voice it just makes me so happy you know man that is just like what music is all about you know what you just said it and you know when you get that connection i mean there's literally nothing else like that yeah. you know i mean it's not like okay sex is different but is it, but it, it's sex is probably on the same level but it's different you know senses obviously to have that kind of connection it's just like it's just such a cool feeling that you could just put something on and like your whole day turns around and the mood you're in turns around and like everything about life looks beautiful just when you hear a certain song, you know? Yeah. I think it's so powerful, man. Feels like he's singing to me, you know, or he's, he's my inner voice or something, you know, he's got this really dry sense of humor and, but it's just, I mean, I hate to say like, I'm not even going to go there, but he, he's just, got, <laughs> he's just got the soul that I, you know, it, it speaks to me. That's great. And then, and then the third one, which, you know, I can't tell you how much this record changed my life, but um, it's a double album on prestige by the staple singers called great day. And it's just incredible. I mean, besides just the sound of it, uh, pop staples, guitar, mm -hmm and the songs and then Mavis Staples just her you know I mean you just can't even get there's nothing that good like young Mavis singing it's just and these great gospel songs and just the way they the arrangements are just so perfect and the way it's recorded I don't know where it was recorded I wish I could talk to her about it but that's Rick the, yeah I know I I, I you know, I always pepper him with too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> he's a sweet guy, man. He's a real easy. He's a really sweet guy, man. I got to say, he's one of my favorite, you know, guys, one of my contemporaries. And yeah. I've, I've been hip to him for a long time. Back when he was in William Clark's band, I used to just oh, talk that's a lot. of him, you know, and he, it's just so great to see him and Jeff and Steve in that band working with such a great artist i'm so happy for everyone and happy for mavis that she found someone so good who can do justice to her dad's parts because you know pops is one of the all-time great guitar players i mean uh, he absolutely invented, invented the whole thing so so that record great days i think that's what it's called it's a double album on prestige just phenomenal and let me just tell you, uh, the guitar player we were just talking about is a guy named Rick Holmstrom, H-O-L-M-S-T-R-O-M. He's the guy that uh, introduced Smokey and I. And I interviewed Rick, and you can look on the everyonelovesguitar.com uh, webpage. It's uh, episode 234. Great guy. Great interview. Uh, it was really cool. Hey, just a few more questions. Three more questions, Smokey, and I'm going to let you go. I really appreciate your time. This has been real, uh, really fun and a lot, very interesting, and thank you very much. If you can go back in time and do one thing differently, either business or personal, would you have anything at all? Um, hmm. You know, it's hard. That's a hard question because there are things I wish I had done, but if I had, everything would be different. So yeah. I, I, I don't have any regrets. I'm pretty happy with who I am and where I am in my life. But for sure, I wish I had been a little bit more uh, courageous 
during the um, early 80s in terms of going to see take advantage of the punk rock scene that was happening around me i didn't i didn't even get hip to the punk things st- till 88 when i was in the blasters and started meeting some of those people so i really missed the boat on mm. that whole the la punk rock scene i mean i would i i actually saw an ex cramps i mean ex germs show and walked out because um i couldn't i couldn't dig x at the time i just i like billy but i remember telling my friend which is really funny because i love x now and i'm friends with those guys but at the time i was <laughs> telling my friend this chick can't sing <laughs> i'm out of here <laughs> but, but, but then again, I I walked out of a Van Halen show in '78 too, so you know I was just and cool. everything everything happens, you know, when it's supposed to happen, you know, it's that's just the way shit works. Yeah, you know? so I I, I was kind of clueless, you know, and um, of course I was at the time I wanted to be an actor and I was dancing, so my mind was on other things. Sure. Um. So I mean, that's a minor thing. I wish I had maybe done a few less drugs. <laughs> that's a very common uh you know what guy when i'm talking to guys our age it's a very common thread i wish i laid off the drugs a little bo- a little bit more you know i wish i was a little more present because i was too much yeah that's a pretty common thing and in retrospect you know i was as present as i could be you know uh, we all have our demons so i, a- I feel you man <laughs> no i totally get it yeah you know maybe not uh maybe it goes back to the other thing of don't take it personally, you know, maybe a lot of, you know, I, I got a lot, I was, I had a lot of good mentors, but I also had people who weren't such good mentors who gave me a lot of bad advice or maybe I took things personally that maybe I shouldn't have. So, mm. um, you know, I just, in retrospect, maybe I wish I had had, you know, if I could go back and talk to my younger self, I would say, well, you know, don't worry about it. Have more confidence. You're okay. You know. Yeah, it's it's You're a f- confidence is a funny thing, isn't it? Like it just sort of comes. You know, I mean, it's it, as you get older, it just like suddenly shows up, and you're. It's like such a relief, isn't it? It's like, yeah, wow. I don't have to give a shit about any of this stuff I used to worry about. It's like really, at least for me, it was like, wow, that's fucking great. <laughs> I have a specific thing, a specific regret I will mention. And it's, yeah. it's very personal and it is very uh, kind of risky to talk about. Uh, but I'm going to take a leap here because your listeners are mostly professional guitar players. So I think it's an important lesson. When I was playing with Tom Waits, we had um, – a big, our first big show in LA, there was an after party and I was so exhausted and overwhelmed and I'd just fallen in love with someone and I decided to skip the after party. I didn't think it would be a problem. You know, I, I was actually just really needed to be with this woman and and have some downtime sure but i think it alienated uh it might have planted the seeds of alienating tom and his not so much tom but maybe his the people around him and um because there was a lot of you know it was it was at a celebrity's house there were a lot of hollywood people there and it was uh, i was not part of the team yeah. by not skipping out on, on the after party. I actually sort of removed myself from the team a little bit, not consciously. No, of course not. But it's one of those things that did kind of affect, you know, it, it, it reverberated later on. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I have no Tom and I have no issues or, you know, there's no, no bad feelings there, but that was something that I regret doing. You know, yeah. like, like I should have, I should have, you know, I mean, I was invited as a guest of honor to a celebrity's house to celebrate this gig that I was so proud of. 
but I didn't go. (laughs) There's things like that where it's just like, I couldn't, whatever my issue was, you know, it was just really that I was in love with this woman and I needed some time with her. Yeah. (laughs) But 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 you know what, man, I, I totally get that. Man, I totally, I can't tell you how many things I've blown off to hang out with my wife. And I, and some of them like you, like your thing there are stupid because I could have networked or in many cases it was about me or about a team or something I was part of. And, um, my problem is I've never been a, a good team player. I've never been, I always had a problem with authority. So like my thing was always like, well, you should be there. I'm like, well, fuck that. Just because I'm supposed to be there. I'm like, I I, I, I want to hang out with Ann and then I'm supposed to be there. So, which is so, which is a kid, you know, thing. And I'm still like that, but I'd be smart enough now to know, hey, you know, go to the event and then hang out. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't, I'm not beating myself up over it, but yeah, it's yeah. definitely, it relates to what you said, the authority thing too. Yeah. There's some of that in there oh, too. Totally. Um, but yeah, it was so so that's like that's a really minor thing, but that's something that I think is I've learned from that mistake. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, <laughs> no. I think it, thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of people listening to to this are faced with this probably on a regular basis, you know. And today, probably more than ever, it's important that you go to those meetings because, you know, as in the music business, in my limited exposure, just through this podcast it is 100 percent a business built on relationships i mean i don't think again as a guy coming outside from the business world i don't think there's been another business that is more closely tied to relationships than this industry so thank you for sharing that. i think that was really cool well you're welcome and i hope i hope it helps your listeners yeah man out there <laughs> and if anybody's pissed because she didn't go to that party come on fucking get over it it was years ago <laughs> Hey, I'm going to ask you just one more question, Smokey. Um, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of this change has been deliberate and intentional? And how much has just been a natural part of aging? Wow. Uh, well, um, I, my my personality has definitely changed. I've definitely become more jaded, um, less joyful, um, and um, a little more serious in general. But at the same time, I think I'm becoming a little more open and sensitive, like more my heart chakra or whatever is starting Mm. to open up a little more. Um, and a lot of it's aging. Um, but a lot of it is also the way our society has changed. Um, you know, nine 11 had a huge impact on me. I was already starting to question, uh, the, the old paradigm of left and right and Democrat versus Republican. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, and I just watched how... Were you in the city at the time? Oh, yeah. I yeah. was here when it happened. Um, I was actually trying to get downtown on the ferry from Hoboken Holy when shit. the second plane hit. And I didn't even see it. I just, you know, I saw the ferry coming in, and they were shutting down. I was like, what the fuck? And the guy, like, pointed. So I was that close that I had to actually look up to Holy see. Holy shit. Um just watching how the media covered it. It was just like, okay, yes, I'm paranoid, but yes, something is wrong. And, um, and so in other words, you know, uh, um, a lot of people around me, uh, didn't want to hear what I had to say about it. A lot of people don't want to question the mainstream. Yeah. So, um, that's been really hard because I had that, you know, once you put on the glasses, you can't take it off. You know, you can't unsee. Once you see through the, the facade, you can't. Yeah. It's hard to go back. So. Um, it's true in everything, man. Yeah. Uh, whenever you'd like you have a major shift in viewpoint or you feel you got, you know, clarity or truth. That's. Yeah. So, so in, you know, not to get 
heavy in politics, but I feel like, um, you know, it, it, not everyone wants to know what you feel or what you think and finding, you know, I, I'm learning how to find, okay, who can I talk to what about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't mm -hmm. talk to everyone about everything. We're not all at the same place. So sure. you have to sort of pick and choose. And, and, um, there's this Africans, uh, guitar player, great African guitar player named Franco. He was from Congo and he had an amazing career. He was one of the founders of Congolese rumba and he died of AIDS in the early nineties, but he had the song Likambi E Ngoma. And it's just, it basically, the lyrics are like, watch what you say. <laughs> don't, don't mind other people's business mind your own business you know it's this totally paranoid thing but he's right i mean we're times are different now and people especially with the internet i mean look at celebrities tweeting and then yeah things blowing up you know so we really have to um i don't know for okay so for me the big personal change that had a lot to do with it so but it also you know, I, I lost a lot of joy with that awakening, you know, because shit is so dark. It's hard to find the joy, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the music is the, the key. And like my Western swing gig, gig when I'm singing roly poly, for example, I'm not thinking about the <laughs> state, you know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not thinking about, um, you know, I mean, I, I know that there's a shift going on in human consciousness right now. I know that we're on the brink of some major change. It's, it, you know, the, the 2012 Mayan calendar, I think that something changed then and we're in the beginning of something new. You know, people, it's not tangible. It's nothing we can see, but I feel it in my heart. I feel like there's, there's, a sh there's definitely a transition going on for humanity and musicians play a big part in that, in the healing yeah. that we need to do. I mean, just in terms of women, if you're a sensitive man, you have to recognize that, okay, it's time for us to heal this thing for, for women. Yeah. You know, women need to heal and we need to be part of it. Um, you know, as musicians, we can help that, you know, if I can get a couple to dance together and forget about that, their differences, yeah. I'm not thinking about it, but it's hard to, to come to that place of joy or that to let go of all that shit. And then actually, you know, do your job as a musician. It's, it gets harder and yeah. harder to do that. Um, and I'm so lucky that I, that's why I cherish, Sonny's bar and the people that come regularly and the musicians that I work with. And I, I'm sure I alienate people sometimes when I talk too much about things people don't want to hear. And I try not to, <laughs> but um, I know in my heart that we're all going through a transition right now. And uh, so, so that awareness is been made it hard and maybe it's maturity too coming in. Um, I certainly, uh, you know, don't, don't feel any less, um, excited when I see the ladies on the street and their summer dresses <laughs> still feel like I'm 14, you know, or 18, whatever, uh, even though I'm not, um, that's a weird thing, isn't it? When you're like, cause I experienced that, like just random with shit. I'll be like, man. I feel like I'm like 25, but I know I'm not even remotely 25. And, but I mean, I'm very happy that I get to feel that way. And I, at the same time, regretful, like I didn't feel this good when I was 25. What the fuck? <laughs> if I knew that, what I know now, man, <laughs> you know, it's just a weird, a weird thing, man. Especially my kids are, uh, I have a 28 year old and a 26 year old. So, um, you know, I do different things with them and it's kind of like, it's just a whole different, it's just different, man. I don't, can't, it, uh, it, 
it, it's just a such a big thing. I can't explain it even, man. Sorry, I don't mean to take you no, off. It's all right. I can I I I I want to ask you questions. <laughs> well, I, so, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I, I I don't regret not having kids myself, just because of my lifestyle and my relationships and stuff. I don't think sure. I would have been able to to be the kind of parent I'd like to be. And also, I my hats off to anyone who's a parent now because. I feel like it's so hard just the the amount of shit you have to deal with in terms of you know the government <laughs> or just, know, society all the new rules and the new th- I mean my childhood was completely unsupervised like you know my parents would totally been arrested for the shit I got into when I was a kid all if, of us if that now you know yeah. forget it you know so um yeah it must be a huge challenge. Uh, well, for me, the biggest challenge was I always felt this tremendous sense of responsibility. You know, I took parenting really, really seriously. And um, some of that is because I didn't have very good parents. Or I really didn't know what the fuck to do. So I was like consciously aware of like, you know, these are serious decisions. And so I put like a lot of intensity. So as my kids got, now that they're older, honestly, it's a big relief that I'm here now as a supporting role, which is like, it's great, you know, and I'm, oh, and I'm, I'm, I talk to them almost every day. And, but that has been great to be honest with you. It was really, you know, I just took that thing really, I, 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 I take every responsibility I have pretty seriously. I don't know why. I mean, maybe too, too seriously, but um, that was one that I didn't want to fuck up. And it was just, you know, and I know I made mistakes you know, and I've always, I've always, one thing I always told my kids, I'm sorry, I, I screwed that up and I was never afraid to say sorry. And I'm really glad I, did. and I'm still not, I mean, me being right to, for me being right is not really important. Never has been. I just want to try to be a better person kind of. So, you know, you got to fuck up a lot along the way. <laughs> well, that's okay. That leads me to something I wanted to tell you because, and for your listeners, because being right is the first thing you sort of have to let go of in this business. Um, my role with Rick Rubin over the years has been really interesting. So with Rick, we had this really interesting relationship or have this really interesting relationship where we'll be sitting there with the artist and the other musicians. We're listening to a demo. We're about to go in and do the song. Or maybe we've been working on it and we're just discussing, okay, what do we need to do? And he'll say, well, for example, um, he'll say, well, what do you, what do you, what do you guys think? And I'll say, oh, well, why don't we emphasize the backbeat? Cause this thing, it's, it really, to me, it feels like it really wants to take off. And he'll say, oh, that's a dumb idea. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> that's like lead, leadership you know. 101. <laughs> like, oh, fuck. What the- <laughs> You know, what did I do? Am I going to get fired? But I was t- called back every time. And and uh, I realized he needed s- to be able to say that to someone so that the artist would recognize that he had a strong opinion or had the authority. Like, he can't say that to the artist, but he needs to show that that he's the leader. Mm. So that's part of my job. And also he, you know, if I did have a good idea, he's not going to tell me that's stupid. You know, he, he's being himself. So, but, but part of my job was to volunteer (laughs) that stuff to get shut down because it was part of the dynamic. That's what he needed as a producer to have, you know, if, if he was in the room and heard us saying that he said, yeah, that's bullshit or whatever. (laughs) But I, I recognize when it happened, especially like with the Dixie chicks, because there there's three women with very strong, each has a strong individual personality. Sure. And, um, and so, you know, he's trying to get a drum track, you know, the way he wants it. And, and if you give them a chance to focus on everything, they'll have an opinion about everything. But meanwhile, he'd throw me in there with, he'd say, okay, we'll learn their the guitar part on the demo and it's it's you know emily who played the guitar on it 
she's got her own style that's very specific and I can't play like that. So mm. I'm reducing it to what I can do that I know Rick wants, like a sort of a basic thing that I know. But, and, and they're coming in or he's coming, you know, each one is taking turns. No, I didn't like that. Play, play it more like this, play it more. And they're, they're all like focusing on the guitar part. Meanwhile, he's getting the drum track he needs. <laughs> I'm the decoy, you know, <laughs> and that's part of my job. So I had to sort of accept that, okay, yeah. I'm not going to be right. I'm yeah. never going to be right. But meanwhile, when the record came out, who's on every track? I am. There who's, you go. And, and there'd be like a, a big, like a build up and then a breakdown to just guitar and drums, usually just my playing rhythm. So it was one of those things where, I swear every day on that record, I thought I was going to get fired. I was like, really? oh, it's going to get that call. Like, don't bother coming back. And, you know, I was there for the whole thing. And, and they were, and finally at the end, they were all telling me how much they liked what I did. <laughs> but, but it was a hard, you know, because, and it's just, they well, when you got three people to make happy. That is like exponentially uh, almost impossible. And three very picky people you know who had yeah. a skin in it because this was after their whole blow up with the bush thing sure. so this, this record was really important for them i mean it won a grammy for the best album it, i don't know if it sold as much well that was when the business was starting to really record sales were really going down that year so um but it was a success you know it, it was i think it was good for them and and everyone was happy but it was not easy <laughs> and and once I figured out, oh, that's my job, well, then it was cool. I was just like, whatever, I'm not going to, you know, I can't please everybody, you know. No, you but, certainly can't please everybody. No, was, so. was that the record that David Grissom toured with? Toured with them? Uh, I think he did the tour, yeah. 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 I, it's funny, I knew him from you before. We did a Bruce Willis gig together. That's and funny. I was so enamored with his playing and his sound and everything. Totally the opposite of me we had completely different styles oh, yeah. but somehow we we managed to uh, get along and then i found out that he was their guy and then he did that tour and it was like oh wow and I, unfortunately I never got to see the show because when they came through town i was busy with something else and i would have loved to to see that but um he's an interesting guy he's his interview i interviewed him it's probably like one of the most popular interviews actually I should check that yeah, out. Yeah, it's pretty good. It was he, he talked about getting sober on there and he was you know, because he's normally kind of close to the vest, but he was very um you know, very open and 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 I think um yeah, was, we had a good conversation, Tom was like, like this conversation, man. It was pretty wow. no no all, uh, unchained. <laughs> well, uh I, I don't think I said anything I'm gonna regret. But <laughs> no, man, you're great. And uh, let me tell, let's tell people where they could find you. First of all, it's Smokey Hormel, S-M-O-K-E-Y-H-O-R-M-E-L. He's got a weekly gig in Brooklyn at Sonny's, and that's every... Sonny's bar every Wednesday night at 10. Great. And that's Sonny, S-O-N-N or S-U-N-N? S-U-N-N-Y-E-S. Y-S. Great. <laughs> Sonny's bar, S-U-N-N-Y-S, and that's at every Wednesday night at 10. And uh, go check Smokey out if you're in New York City. He's a really sweet player, man. He's a gr very good player, and he just uh, he'll make you feel good. And he'll actually, he probably get your leg because he's gonna get you dancing. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a man and you want to dance, you got chances there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, he's got another. He's got an album coming out soon. It's Smokey Secret Family, his Brazilian stuff. Uh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, the record's called Hombres Complicados. <laughs> Complicated friends? Complicated men. <laughs> oh, aren't we all? <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a joke, but uh, no, not really. But the, it's a, I've been playing with uh, these three Brazilian percussionists for uh, a while. And, uh, and additionally, I've got uh, this guy, David Hofstra, who's a great bassist and plays tuba. So in this group, it's there's some a lot of tuba, and then uh, Clark Gayton, who's a amazing trombone player. He's been out on the road with Springsteen the last few years, and uh, he's just a wonderful jazz player. 
And then Doug Weaselman plays uh, clarinet and Barry Sax in it. He sort of goes back and forth. And we do music from the Caribbean, from Africa, um, and some Brazilian country music. Again, it's a, a group dedicated to dance music. So it's a real rocking thing. It's mostly instrumental, um, hardly any vocals at all, but it's really fun. And these, uh, the three percussionists are um, Tony Mola, Mea Noice, who's a master uh, drummer, and uh, Davi Vieira, who's out on the road right now with David Byrne on his tour. But hopefully when he's done with that, he'll come back and play with me again. Awesome. So I'm really lucky to get to live in New York with so many great musicians and to get to work with them. And, and that's uh, Hombres Complicados, and it'll be out. And go to uh, Smokey's website, SmokeyHormel.com. Sign up to get on his list, and then he'll let you know when the album comes out. And please support him and his music when it comes out. And I'm going to let you talk about the last Omar in DA. I'm not going to mess that up. Or in DIA. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've been really lucky to um, fall in with some Senegalese musicians who uh, hang out at this gallery in my neighborhood. It's just it's kind of a random thing. Here's, here I am listening to all this African guitar Next thing I know, there's an African guy moves into my town and opens up an art gallery. And then there's all these Africans hanging out. So uh, it's been a couple years I've been hanging out there. And one of the guys that came through town is this amazing singer-songwriter, guitarist from Senegal named Omar and DIA. He's a, just a really uh, beautiful soul, a spiritual person. And he writes these incredible songs that are all in uh, Wolof, which is a Senegalese language. Um, but he's translated them for me and beautiful poetry. And the music is exactly what, you know, someone from a blues and, and uh, roots music background, it just really spoke to me. So we started recording collaborating on this record and it's almost finished and i'm very excited about it we don't have a label so uh watch keep your eye on my website and once we i know what's going on with it i'll post something but awesome uh, yeah are you on social media no okay no. so go to Smokey's website smokeyhormel.com and uh if you haven't ever heard Brazilian music or the African stuff, it's really cool. Especially, I, I really like the African stuff. It's uh, the especially the guitar stuff. It's really, uh, it's Smokey and I were talking about before the the scales aren't necessarily different, but the rhythms that they use make them sound kind of different. It's good stuff, man. Really good stuff. And um, and that's it, man. Thank you very much. I can't thank you enough. You're really generous with your time, and I really appreciate all the cool stories, Smokey. Thanks. I, I'm I'm really honored that I could do this and to be in such great company. Um, I I was just thinking, like, while you were taking a little break, I was thinking, <laughs> like, what would I ask Robin Ford if I was going to interview him? And yeah, you have uh, a good question. I would just say, you know, I want to know more about playing with Miles and you know, what that did to him, you know, <laughs> I mean, I saw what it did to him or heard what it did to him musically, but just if he could have any good stories about that. Yeah. I, that's one of my questions actually, is what was that experience like? You know, I had to be careful because a lot of people, I always have to, I try not to be the guy that asks the same questions everybody else does. Yeah. So I, I think I asked him that, but, um, I think in a really specific way is not like, tell me about playing with miles, you know, more like what you just said, like what was the, the long-term impact of that on you both personally and professionally or something like personally and musically. Well, I remember an interview with miles talking about Robin saying he liked the way he played on top of the beat. And that's something that I love about Robin. And I love about a lot of musicians. I, I think a lot of guitar players and, I don't want to point fingers, uh, blame it all on Clapton, but <laughs> a lot of musicians like to play behind the beat a little bit. And um, 
I think that's one of the things that Robin has there. He's not afraid to play on top of the beat. You know, he, he's, he can push the rhythm. Um, I mean, he plays with such great rhythm sections that, you know, it, you can't do it unless you're playing with a good rhythm section. Cause, yeah, man, that's for sure. But yeah. And I love this question where you asked, I, I'm going to, I'm going to answer one of the questions you didn't ask. Go ahead, me. man. Let's do it. You said, uh, if heaven exists, <laughs> what would you like to hear God say when you arrive there? Yeah. <laughs> Which? And uh, the answer is, good job. Who do you want to be next? <laughs> <laughs> I had a guitar player one time said, don't forget to bring your amp. <laughs> that was a really good one. I, that was very cute. I thought that was pretty cool, man. There's no amps here. <laughs> no amps in heaven. Well, well, man, listen, I can't thank you enough, Smokey. And everybody, please come out and sw support Smokey Hormel. Check out his new music when it comes out. And if you're in New York City, uh, go to Sonny's Bar on Wednesday nights at 10 and uh, shake a leg. So thanks, brother. All right. Thank you, Craig. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks so much to Smokey Hormel for spending time with us. I appreciate it. Please go out and support him and his music. And make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com and sign up to get our newsletter right now. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.